is a mass misconception when it comes to people who are heavily anti the continued uh, support of Ukraine. Russia is not isolated, no matter what the West likes to say. It's so then I hear you use the word like multipolarity, and it's like, oh, well, okay, a whole time she's pro-Russian, right? There are a lot of interesting conversations about what the end of the conflict looks like, but 99% of the time, I don't mind when citizens are saying stupid things because you don't have all day to sit on the internet and research every topic, and I get it. But man, it feels like there are so many commentators that just lie about everything. It's just too scary scary now and I see so much like in lockstep communication about stuff related to Russia and Ukraine. I hear so many things behind the scenes and I've seen so many things and I wonder sometimes we went from just having an environment where people disagreed and they exaggerated the truth or lied and now we've got people that intentionally to grift spread disinformation. They've got unprecedented access to audiences all over the world. They're making millions of dollars doing it and foreign governments can step in and kind of like apply pressure in certain areas as well. That environment is almost impossible for a good faith consumer to survive in. We're starting off lighthearted then, I guess. <laughs> Listen, wherever you want to start, whatever, yeah, well, wherever you want to go. I think um, we have a mutual friend. Was it John Spencer? No, it wasn't John Spencer. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Or... Was it John? No, no, it was somebody from got... um, uh, from Task and Purpose. Um, oh, Chris. Chris, yeah. Happy. I'm thinking John Spencer because I just uh, chatted with him last night. But yeah, it was Chris from Task and Purpose, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we've, um, I had Chris on actually last week. Uh, we chatted for a, a good long while. I'd never come across his channel until now. And uh, yeah, and then I saw him chatting with you and I was like, wait, I've heard Destiny before, you know, that's uh, that's someone I need to speak to, right? That that would be a good... I've also heard you in Twitter spaces when you're going off against uh, all the, well, MAGA nutters um, across the... Uh, <laughs> across Mars. Um yeah. yeah, I don't know. What do you think of... I don't know, first question, really. I don't know. Let's have a chat about the uh, the um, the debate. That was quite a quite an experience. It was, yeah. Um, I I mean, as a I mean, I'm I'm pretty staunchly Democrat, obviously at this point in terms of who I'm voting for. I think that everybody was kind of holding their breath on the Democrat side to hope that Kamala wouldn't have any major fumbles or screw up, and I think she did pretty well. Uh, I thought her attacks and defenses were on point. I think that Trump kind of had a mini meltdown. Uh, although it's hard to see like how it's going to be perceived because I feel like Trump is on permanent meltdown mode, obviously, and most of the electorate doesn't necessarily view him that way. So, yeah, but I'm I'm pretty happy with that one, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that the beginning was, uh, I think this was for Trump's to, to lose, if that makes sense. I, I don't think Harris added as much substance in policy as she could have otherwise done. Um, but she was very well prepared to bait Trump in almost every single way. Uh, and eventually, when he, she mentioned the crowd sizes, that's the moment that I think got to him. Up until yeah. that point, he was being quite restrained, well, for Trump at least. Um, and then that just kicked him off, you know? Yeah, I think that he definitely... Um one of the things that I advocate more for is trying to trigger him because I think he's very easy to get triggered. And yeah, calling him a loser, saying his plans are weak, making fun of his hand size or rally sizes. I think it's very easy to just throw a small quip in there. And I think it completely um, like destroys his mind. And I highly encourage her to do that. She should do that more, I think. Yeah, Yeah. no, I think she's a uh, best place. What I also find quite amusing is that the media was quick to also frame this as well he's he's pretty old now guy is a bit like everyone else was criticizing biden for being too old now the mainstream media and it, you know mm -hmm. um the others who were receiving it have uh, basically flipped the script uh, flipped the switch and it's now on the other hand you know that she's on the other foot right yeah so <laughs> yeah it was quite satisfying to see yeah that. yeah i think um, they, they should definitely lean into the age attacks and everything more too i mean if because that was trump's main card against biden and now that biden's out that makes trump the oldest guy running for president i think ever so yeah you might as well yeah yeah, but from what I saw that the, I mean, she, Harris is leading, I think, in what, the Rust Belt, Wisconsin, Michigan come to mind. She's got, a, I think, a three-point lead in Wisconsin and two-point lead in Michigan the last time I looked at the polls. Um, Maybe, yeah, it's really, it's close say. everywhere and it's going up and down and like, yeah, so it's it's hard to say what's going to, yeah, everything is very, very, very close, yeah. But do you think that this is going to hamper or, or, or but do you think it's going to have a sizable impact? Because a lot of people think that polls don't often have a big impact. The, the, um, the debates themselves don't always have a big impact, albeit the one with Biden was different for obvious reasons. Yeah, I don't think I think that this debate could have been really bad for Kamala or it could just be kind of neutral. And I think it's going to be neutral. Um, I don't think that. 
like nobody's seeing this and like, oh my God, like I'm definitely voting for Kamala now and I wasn't even going to consider it before and Trump can't do anything at this point, I don't think, to lose any support from his base. So yeah, I, I don't know if the debates will have any major impact from here forward unless something catastrophic happens at one of them. Where are you streaming from at the moment? Uh, I live in Miami Beach. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pent up here in London at the moment. It was 13 degrees, which is colder than some parts of Spain ever get at times of the year. So uh, we're officially sort of in, uh, in November or whatever. But um, yeah, okay. That's not like it's cushy. Uh, but I've seen you on some other podcasts. Um, is it Fresh and Fit? With, yeah, probably. Uh, They're down here pretty close. Yeah. I get around to a lot of different podcasts. Yeah. yeah. yeah but, but you seem to like to put yourself in the lines then a fair amount. Not just uh, with fellow, you know, moderates or liberal moderates like myself. Yeah, I think I have kind of a, my, just my internet background and everything has my brain wired for conflict. So it's fun to fight with people. And I, yeah, I feel like it's pretty easy when it comes to conservatives. So. Okay. All right. Well, we could have a, I don't know if we'll, I don't know, actually, I was wondering where, before we went on air, what would we be potentially dis, uh, disagreeing over? Um, also, it's eight o'clock here, eight oh seven or so. So I'm, I'm having a beer. Um, I don't You're know fine. if you drink or your things, but um, yeah, oh no, my, it's uh, my Red Bull here. Yeah. Okay, there you go. We could have a, a, a beer Red Bull if you've had one of those before. <laughs> yeah, don't go, don't go to Indonesia at times of the year. It's uh, highly interesting what they combine. In Indonesia, you said. Yeah, oh. yeah. In, in Indonesia, I had it in Africa, a beer and Red Bull once. Um, lived out in Africa for a bit, so that was quite fun. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah. What do you? So uh, you are. Yeah, what tell, tell for my audience? Yeah, what do you do? Share share what your what kind of content do you what prefer, I, what do? You what do I do? Well, hello, Destiny's audience. Uh, my name's Piotr. Um, I lived in the US for about five years, actually, in Washington. I work in the fields that uh, you like to debate a lot, Destiny, which is uh, uh, foreign policy, international relations. I got my master's at SICE, Johns Hopkins, uh, in Washington. Uh, I've worked in the UN. I've worked in the World Bank. Worked in um, International Crisis Group, which is like a um, non-for-profit which looks at sort of conflict mediation and resolution uh so i'm not well i don't like to think of myself as purely a uh, as so although i am awkwardly sitting on a sofa at this moment in time sofa commentator um you know i've actually seen some things um and lived out in africa for a couple of years so it gives you uh i think a different grasp on things and and my channel where i do more well like this you know podcasting interviews is it's pretty geopolitical, although I try and bring in some of the economics. I don't go too much into U.S. domestics, mainly because I just don't, well, who, what's better than a Brit talking about U.S. politics, I suppose. Sure. Um, but um, I mean, we all had strong opinions yeah, about Brexit you know, over here, it, especially with quite, Trump, so I'm sure you guys are used to oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, then I, me then. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I don't know. My podcast, the show I try to create is sort of a, a new variance of the the world is changing and there's multipolarity and I think that we need to recognize that and the West needs to stop, particularly people in Whitehall and Washington, they need to recognize that the uh, continued approach to things doesn't work and hasn't worked for a long time uh, and a, a greater degree of, I think, humility over hubris is uh, is necessary. You know, one of the things I think people don't even have a problem with in, say, Ukraine and Russia is not even that they agree with Russia necessarily, it's just they're fed up with the hypocrisy of Western nations. That's the main comment or criticism I see. And so trying to, I think, host a conversation or show where we engage people who have those, you know, decisions in mind uh, to be more reflective and sort of um, conscious of the mistakes the West has made is, is, is a good thing. So I don't know. It's, uh, you know, it's perhaps not as uh, lively as yours every time, although I do host debates occasionally. Sure. So <laughs> I mean, we've done, we've done a fair bit of like the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um I guess what are your, I mean, what do you think about Russia Ukraine? It's pretty broad. Um, what? Oh boy! You met you. So you mentioned uh, Western mistakes. I guess. What are your kind of like broad feelings? I guess then on um, what the goal should be for winding down that conflict. Well, I think that the war is. Um, I, I think there's a mass misconception when it comes to the. Um, uh, should we say people who are heavily, heavily anti? Uh, the continued uh, support of Ukraine. Not mm -hmm. necessarily, like, I, I don't, I'm skeptical of the likelihood that Ukraine can win outright, as with everything is a spectrum, right? Just because I'm skeptical of Ukraine's ability to win outright militarily doesn't mean that I don't support Ukraine's right to self exist and sovereignty, but people interpret that as being pro Putin. But then on the other side, because I'm against a, another nation state invading another nation state, uh, that makes me somehow sort of 
pro 100% everything Ukraine does, which it, it's not that binary. Um, I personally think that people need to understand that even if the United States withdraws all of its financial support, the war will still the war will still continue. Albeit it'll be over, but it would still you you get raids, you get smaller kinds of conflicts conflicts going on with the Ukrainians, you know, doing what they did across borders with Kirk, but within their you know within the oblast that they're part of Ukraine, that would that would probably be what happened. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, I think another misconception is that people seem to think that because NATO is supporting Ukraine, but because Russia is still acquiring territory, sort of NATO are being terribly overwhelmed and are a useful organization. Sort of the, the, the degree of conflation in this war, I think, is, is, um, uh, is mind boggling, frankly, because they don't seem to understand that there's a difference between NATO members supplying weapons to Ukraine versus actual NATO members fighting firsthand. If you want all 33 nations to get involved in this war against one singular nation, it's probably going to be a bit lopsided, but people are very lacking in, in sort of well, nuance and uh, military uh, understanding. So uh, th those are just a couple of things. But I, when it comes to mistakes by the West, I, I do think that the West could have done a better job of engaging Russia in the run up to, um, well, 2000s and 2010s. Um, not that they didn't try. We had the, uh, the pun another couple of bits of history that people always like. A Partnership for P Peace initiative, which mm -hmm. the NATO alliance established in 94. That was what Russia and Ukraine were both invited to and are still technically a part of. Then in 97, the Clintons established the founding act um, between NATO and Russia, which was an attempt to sort of build di diplomatic engagement. And then um, 2002 was the NATO Russia Council creation or establishment, which was basically you know, a real multilateral effort to bring Russia into the fray. Obviously, it was just after the uh, September and the 11th. war and terrorism and everything, yeah. Yeah, so they were like, well, Russia will be a great asset and a partner to work within NATO. At this point, NATO didn't really have a clear idea of what its identity was going to be. Was it going to be counterinsurgency, countering terrorism? So, yeah. Um, and then things began to shift. Putin's... Um, shall we say, uh, um, opposition and disagreement or uncomfortability with the Orange Revolution, particularly in Ukraine, but also just all the revolutions that were seen, well, revolutions, you know what I mean, these, these strong anti-Soviet, anti-Dom oppressionist things, um, began to get under his skin. And um, that's what led to 2007, the very infamous Munich speech. Um, where he made his comments quite clear. And then 2008 in Georgia was the beginning of the what people call the second phase of Putin, because Putin has changed, as we all do, but Putin, you can sort of put Putin's mentality towards the West and international relations into sort of three or four different personality traits, another one being post-COVID. He's changed a lot. Um, and, yeah, another one was probably the Snow Revolution, which is the West's term for when in 2011-12 you had these very big protests in the cities of Russia. It's all well and good for, you know, rural populations to have grievances, but they're not the ones with the no knowledge and the understanding of the reality outside of Russia. And so when you start getting the intelligentsia, so to speak, or the, uh, you know, the students and the more professionals, right, um, protesting or demonstrating in St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg or wherever, that was what made Putin very uh, uncomfortable. And that was all because he had changed the constitution so that he could basically run indefinitely. Anyway, that was my history lesson. Okay. Um, do you think that when, when you look at the... What do, you, what do you think should change when you look at the approach that the West is taking right now to, I guess you could say, the conflict in and of itself and then kind of like a broader approach to Russia? Uh, on the uh, second question first, I asked this to John Mearsheimer, um, who I'm sure some of your audience is familiar, he's a well-known academic. Uh, he's become a, some people call him a, a Kremlinite, other people just think he's more really, well, he's a near-realist, right, um, if you follow international relations theory. Um, and I asked him that very question about four years ago, an event in D.C., mm -hmm. and, you know, I said, what will it take for Russia and the US to work closer together because I'm half Russian. My name is Piotr. So, you know, I've got this naive idealism that, you know, one day Russia could be part of the West or at least closer to the West, a bit like India tries to balance, you know, hedge as a strategic partner. And um, he just said one thing, the rise of China, which is a shocking answer from him. Um, but, you know, I don't think until un, 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 until Putin's not in the picture, um, or he severely like, you know, he pays reparations unlimitedly to uh, Ukraine and also Georgia and any other country that he's frankly interfered with. Um, it's not possible. 
and Russia is not isolated, no matter what the West likes to say. It's very supported by China. It's got good relations everywhere. It's a very abundant country, and no matter what the West likes to think, Russia's going to be in demand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as for the more sort of the war itself, I think the... I think it's interesting, really, that not much media attention was paid to it, but there was a victory plan, which Zelensky has sort of been subtly developing in the past few weeks and months. Part of the Kursk incursion, I think, is part of that. A lot of military analysts do. It's not the main reason Zelensky has uh, has in, you know, entered Kurtz. It's not, you know, Kurtz is 1,500 square kilometers that the Russian, uh, that they control. And as we speak, the Russians are making some efforts to push back and, and successfully um but you know a little bit of leverage as much leverage as possible in the event primarily in the event of a trump administration um the war's not going to go on forever but there are different scenarios that we could talk about a frozen conflict which is sort of what i described earlier where you know it's there's a line of contact it's a frozen conflict but there's sparring you know limited sparring across both sides the other option is sort of a dmz like we have in North Korea. Um, people have initially thought that that idea was ridiculous, but seems to be gaining more support in recent months from what I understand. And then, um, you know, a sort of nothing, really. We just sort of, the, the global economy has already absorbed it, right? So the, the degree of normalization of this, like the, with Israel and Hamas, the, the economy adjusts and it absorbs it. Um, maybe the West just, you know, well, maybe America's, but let's focus on the States. Maybe the U.S. internalizes, isolates, or at least puts more protectionist measures in place, economically speaking. Um, and Ukraine's just left to sort of fend for itself with limited support from the European Union, um, which, you know, we can debate about how much the Europeans are doing shit for themselves, which they need to step up for sure. Um, but I, 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 don't, I, I don't think you're ever going to see a clear-cut peace treaty Yes, these are the terms. It will either be a very, very delicate ceasefire or you might get a bit further with a sort of armistice, right? Like in the Korean War, both sides are technically still at war because they never signed a peace agreement. So we could just get this blurry grey zone of, in well, there's a lot of those in international relations, right? Where neither side agree to the terms, right? Russia has six demands still, I think, more or less. Ukraine's not going to agree to them. Um, you know, that's why they've tried to take bits of Kursk, but, you know, and all the while Ukraine is developing its own in-house developments. They've got ballistic missiles they're getting, these drone incursion attacks in and around Moscow, you know, they're shutting down airports. It's becoming a problem. So the biggest, the biggest decider to this will not be on the battlefield, it'll be political. Uh, and anyone who says, oh, Russia will collapse, that's obviously, you know, hyperbole and, and wishful thinking. But pressure from within Russia still is there. Putin's not immune to it. The problem is that no one really knows. Putin's done such a good job of purging and, well, people falling out of windows um, <laughs> that it's well, not very clear. Crashing, who I guess, right? What was, um, yeah, exactly, yeah. right? Russian, yeah. So anyway, it's. Uh, I want you. I want to hear your thoughts because this isn't. A, I don't want this to be like a, a, an interview. I want. I want to have a back and forth. I want to, to chat a bit more. If uh, listen, if you want to do Israel Palestine, my history is much stronger there. I think you know way more about um, Ukraine. I know enough about Ukraine Russia to debating the dipships online. But um, yeah, you definitely have more history here than I do. Um, I, I guess one right, one century. Do you do what? No, don't worry. I, oh. I've got a trigger question for later, but oh. we'll, we'll come to that. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, I, I guess one of the weird things, you used this word earlier, uh, multipolarity, uh, and I'm sure you'll agree with this. One of the frustrating things about having discussions about policy or or politics or geopolitics or anything, any any conflict or anything that's happening right now is it's very hard to... Um, to tell what people even want or what they stand for because so many people are hiding behind things or dog whistling things and it's hard to tell like what's actually happening. So like I, I haven't spoken with you before and I haven't watched a lot of your content. So in my mind, I don't know if I've coded you yet as like a Russian shill or a Western stooge or an anti-establishment contrarian or whatever, right? But so then I hear you use the word like multipolarity and it's like, oh, well, okay, well, so he's pro-Russian, right? And then I hear you speak about, you know, like, oh, Ukraine could do this, or could do this, oh, okay, maybe, you know. Um, and the, and the problems uh, that Putin has, like, oh, okay, maybe, yeah. So it's very frustrating, I guess, to figure out even what, um, it's, it's frustrating to figure out what, what should the macro stage look like? What do people even want it to look like? And when people are talking, what are they talking about? Um, so for instance, like, I don't even get to get into any of these arguments because everybody is so bad faith, but there are a lot of interesting conversations about what the end of the conflict looks like. But 99% of the time I'm talking to people like Greenwald 
or dare I say, even listening to people like Mearsheimer talk, maybe you have more respect for him, I, I guess, than I do. And maybe my disrespect for him is unwarranted. But when I hear people talk about multipolarity <laughs> or what the conflict winding down looks like, I hear the same Russian talking points over and over again that don't actually translate to what's going on. It'll be like the uh, anybody that wants this war to continue on just wants to see Ukrainian men thrown into the meat grinder. And Ukrainians secretly hate this war because there's two articles of you know people trying to dodge a, a conscription. So they want it to end. And the, the West is forcing them to do it with their fake coups and everything else. I was like, okay, well, this is kind of dumb. Um, so it's hard to even cut through uh, to, to, to actually have a real conversation about anything that's happening right now. And all of the people that have hijacked that realm of like, we need to have real talk about, you know, and hard conversations and factual objective talk, all of them are stooges for some other talking points, which is a very frustrating environment to operate in. Um, yeah, I, I, and then I get yeah, more specific I, uh, to Ukraine, Russia, if you want. Those are just general thoughts on that. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, well, I mean, I've got, well, as soon as you, this is why I run a politi geopolitical channel, not a, I don't know, everything channel, because I, I don't know, as soon as you say certain things, I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to, I want to jump in on that. Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, look, firstly, I don't know how sort of academic or nerdy I should go, because I appreciate some people will be like, well, that's, he's a boring talker. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to balance like talking in a way that people will, you know, be interested but also, which doesn't, well, dumb it down, not trying to, but mm -hmm. like, you know, because I think, I, I feel that we're in a world more increasingly where everything's like, oh, you've got to simplify, you've got to dumb it down. No, no, no. People need to step up and educate themselves so that they understand the nuances and details regarding history, context, and geographical differences. A little, yeah. Something that you said earlier is sometimes it's not even nuances. I noticed this domestically in the United States, and I even noticed it to some extent when it came to uh, Brexit. A lot of people will say things, and they just don't actually know how anything works, so they don't understand all the time the gravity of what they're saying, right? Like, uh, you, you brought up a point kind of related to this before, where you spoke about um, the difference between NATO fighting versus NATO shipping weapons. To a lot of people, this is about the same thing, right? They're like, okay, well, sure, we're sending all these weapons to Ukraine. Why don't we just put a no-fly zone? And it's like, okay, well, one of these things is perfectly acceptable. The other one of these things might be World War III. Actually, not, not like everybody says everything's World War They're like, that's actually like a huge deal. You don't understand the difference between these two things. Um, it happened a bit. I, I argued a lot with um, British people talking about Brexit, and they were talking about how they hated the European Union because, like, members of European Parliament, you know, they had no say in who even gets elected to that. And it's like, you have these elections for these people. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. In the United States, people just don't know what the government does. So they mix up like the what the legislature does or what the Supreme Court does. They have no idea. And a lot, yeah, a lot of people's opinions about these things just stem from it's not even that they don't have a nuanced view of things, although that is, that would be like the next issue. But the first issue is they don't even know how any of the things work. So they have no clue. Yeah. Oh, hey, Jake. Um, sorry, Jake Bro commented. He's a he's a well, I think, you know, Jake, Bro, right? He's a he's a he's even more of a Ukraine, Russia um, Dude, the me uh, fantastic content he does on YouTube, but um, mm -hmm. no, I um, I'll put it this way, right? So, well, again, there's so much stuff. I'll, I'll address what you said about multipolarity. Yeah, go for and it. And then I want to we can uh, dive to dive into Brexit, which will probably make me um, down three bottles of wine and the beer because I well, anyway. Um, so basically, I think that multipol. Well, look. People seem to have forgotten what conflation is, or they seem conflation seems to have never been more applicable um, than ever now, in the sense that well, we used an example about this, the delivery of weapons versus the actual direct usage of um, NATO in on the front line, right? Mm -hmm. um, military entities like say the SAS or um, the Navy SEALs in a advisory role within Kiev is not the same as an entire battalion yeah. fighting on the front lines in the line of contact but because people there'll be oh, there'll military. be somebody yeah there'll be somebody that says like a navy seal like unit was present in Ukraine for training the police force or whatever and then people are like oh the US has boots on the ground and it's like not really <laughs> yeah yeah and i for one um, it's very frustrating also because whenever someone asks me a question, I try to do the service of answering it as comprehensively as possible in the shortest amount of time. Problem is people now think on you, um, uh, X, for example, that I'm a windbag. I like the sound of my own voice. I mean, it is a very nice accent to be fair, but um, I'm being facetious audience. But yeah, the point I'm making is that like when you try to uh, add depth and nuance and blah, 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 people are just like, oh, he's he's uh, he's on board. And it's a problem because you're doing a disservice to the complexities and um, historical details of the issues. But anyway, that caveat aside, multipolarity, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's a difference between recognizing that the United States is in a 
I don't think you know. I I, I disagree with is it Ray Ray Powell, whoever wrote the you know the book about great power stuff. You know, one of the finance you know well known finance guys. But basically, this idea that sort of the US is in an inter- a perpetual state of decline. I'm not sure about that. Relative to what the United States has been since the 90s and mid-2000s, other countries have come up. In Western terminology, there's something called wolf warrior diplomacy, which is basically used to describe the way that China's foreign policy has changed since 2012-13, when President Xi Jinping took over. It's much more assertive, it's much more out there, it's much more provocative. Um, uh, and, and this is because since 2013, China has had the confidence under what was known as gradualism, which is a policy of building up its economy and then its political system uh, separately, not simultaneously like shock therapy with the Russians in the 90s, um, is uh, it, it's come to this point now. So China's coming up and it's much more you know, present. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the United States is suddenly like gone. Uh, the, the, you know, the budget for the military is at an all time high, guys. Um, sure, you have domestic issues in turn and polo- polarization and social depri- depri- deprivation in parts of the United States are at some of the highest they've ever been. But this, it's all relative, right? In, in international relations, you have two concepts, absolute and relative, in the terms of power play and, and power dynamics. Um, Russia is a lot more uh, provocative in the way that it u- didn't used to be 10, 12 years ago. A good example of this is uh, North Korea. About seven years ago, Putin made a statement. I'm not going to quote him because I can't remember it, but paraphrasing, he basically said that we must you know, ensure that North Korea doesn't continue to destabilize and escalate using nuclear testing. It was after what was known as the fire and fury within the first six months of Trump's presidency, right? Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's gone. Um, and basically, it, it, the UN Security Council, which you can sort of use as a, as a window into understanding how countries at the highest level of government, this is not a defense of the United Nations, by the way, although I do believe in its concept. Um, Basically, you can use it as an example or a window to understand how countries act based on their vested interests, but also commitments to international uh, international norms and values. So, for example, North Korea was a file where the three big powers, China, Russia and US, would agree almost all the time. England and France, it's not as relevant. They're, you know, they're not the empires anymore. Um, and they don't have the nuclear weaponry to make them in the same level. But, you know, those three don't agree anymore on North Korea. Russia signed a strategic partnership with North Korea. Um, the Chinese are proliferating. Then We just had an analyst on yesterday about this issue. The, the Chinese are proliferating because they feel they need the same amount of active warheads deployed, a 1500, more or less with the Russians, to be considered a great power. So multipolarity is definitely happening. But I don't think we sort of should deny that the United States is still by far the most powerful country. No other country has 800 bases, whether you like it or not. This is not a defense. It's just an acknowledgement. Um, They have over 800. China has one in Djibouti and maybe two or three, you know, in the next two, three years in the Solomon Islands and a couple of other states. So when we talk about, you know, sort of the collapse of the Western led order. Yeah, sure. It's being challenged. And BRICS is definitely a thing. It's, it's coming, but it's not going to happen overnight. And, 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 and can you explain to me which currency is going to replace the United States dollar? Um, the renminbi is still only 3% of reserve currency, maybe 3.5. Oh, wait, it's actually gone down to 2.5, as Reuters reported in March. So this whole hullabaloo about sort of, you know, it, it, you know the end of the Western system is, 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 is upon us is, is hyperbole. It's, it's exaggerated. And, and I'm trying to be like, I agree, things are changing. Absolutely hyper multipolarity there's more forces at work here now but we need to slow down on the um uh on the uh you know well exaggeration and and then sort of um whatever you know hyperbole um as for brexit it's the stupid uh, can i swear on this program uh, uh yeah, it's the stupidest you uh F- if you want real quick oh yeah it's because it seems like you're I don't know if your internet yeah. is lagging a bit or you have a thing open or whatever, but your camera quality drops. Sometimes you're lagging a little bit. You weren't at the beginning. I don't know if you hit your data cap or it's just good old British internet, but. <laughs> I don't know. Is it working all right now? It's working okay. Just the quality degraded and sometimes it skips a word, but I I think you're generally okay now. It was better at the beginning, but okay. go for it. Okay. okay. Can, can continue. Um, let me close some tabs. No, no. All I'm saying is I think Brexit is the stupidest fucking decision that this country has ever made. Um, it single-handedly, and, and not this is me trying to sound like a sub story, but it has single. It, it, yeah, it, it was the singular decision or event that made me completely reconsider the professional and academic trajectory that I was going to take. Um, 
I lost three job opportunities in Europe because of that. Um, and then in the end, I was like, screw it. I'm going to, you know, go and do a master's in the, in the States as well. And, and it, it just completely changed everything. Um, but it, let alone for me, I mean, like people younger than me, you know, um, I'm not saying the EU is the best thing ever. There's a lot of issues with it, but you don't change something by leaving it. Right. There's a, for people who do like their political um, topics or series, there's a fantastic old one called Yes Minister from the 1980s. Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher used to watch it apparently, but basically um, one clip, which I encourage people to, to bring up, I can put it in the comments after our chat, um, talks about why the UK is in the EU. And Sir Humphrey, who is the sort of the civil servant, you know, established establishment benefits from the status quo very much likes being in government he's not elected um he's explaining to the newly elected politician why the europeans enjoy or the english enjoy being in the european union despite it you know them constantly criticizing it because on the inside you can make a quote whole pig's breakfast on it you can set the germans off against the italians the french chop against the dutch the dutch off against the swedish it's fantastic you know the reason why we went into the, the european union in the first place so that we could screw the whole thing up it's obviously a dark um you know comedic twist on it but the point is if you want to make change and influence something you don't just completely leave it and we've seen the economic degradation that departure from the eu has done on the uk economy and you know um the whole idea of immigration Right. We, you just back to the point you were saying about framing things. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that we in the more I don't know, those who don't just use emotions. Right. Brexit is the quintessential example of something that was put side on one side, reason, fact, information, data. On the other side, emotionality, provocation, hyperbole, sensationalism, etc. Right. That side won. And what the other side did was laziness. It was it rested on its laurels, thinking that purely information with no emotive storytelling behind it would be enough to sell to the British people that Brexit was a success or would be a success, was the right thing to do. And we need to change this approach, right? We have the information, we have the facts, we have the ability to sway people because we're telling the truth or we're not exaggerating things. But we need to be better at engaging people from an emotive sense in storytelling, because if we don't, the data is not going to do it for us. Um, and Brexit illustrates that. And that's what I'm trying to do is find methods to use, you know, not, I'm not saying everything in the status quo. Right? I'm not an I'm not 100 percent established. Right? I don't like the World Economic Forum. I think there's a lot of shit wrong in Whitehall and Washington. Right. But the point is that to the point where we're thinking that we should drink bleach as a way to prevent, you know, whatever Trump said in, you know, COVID times, right? We, we are so in a post-truth world in some ways, it's it's disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this whole idea about immigration, this whole idea with immigration in the UK was that if we stop the EU membership, if we leave with Brexit 100%, no deal, you know, hard Brexit, immigration will be stopped or will be severely more under control, take back control. No, it was simply replaced by other people and this isn't my words obviously but people you know we had white europeans people of similar cultural and religious backgrounds replaced with again i'm not saying yeah you know what i mean this is not meant in this way but people who support like oh it's, we've got they're being replaced with non-whites and people who are not christian and people who don't align as much and assimilate with british values right mm -hmm. because we had more and more people coming from the global south trying to fill in jobs that many people from Europe were taking up. The best example is healthcare and NHS. We had so many Europeans who were working in the NHS, gaining experiences. The Polish plumber was a was a, a fandom used to describe how you know a one and a half, two million Polish came to the UK after they joined the EU, and they you know British didn't like it because they were undercutting them because they did a better job. They were paid. They didn't ask for as much, um, but they worked really hard. And now you've got an actual exodus of Polish Brits. You've got Polish going back to Poland because they're earning more money. The economy is overly better. They're able to be at home with their friends and family and, and you know, and cultural and everything. The UK is fucked at the moment. And um, so the whole point about immigration was a lie. It, it didn't stop. It just changed. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if anything, made it worse because we've now got, you know, more and more communities that don't assimilate. Knife crime's gone through the roof. Homicide rates are through the roof. The phone, I have to, I carry my phone. I'm using it as a camera. I carry my phone like this when I'm walking around London and I need to check messages. Because if you're just like this, it will be pulled out of your hand. 
constantly on any street in central London. So anyway, sorry, you, you, I told you you'd trigger me, so you did. No, you're good. That's fine. I'm just writing down stuff, taking notes. Um, what do you think? Uh, one point that you mentioned about like the uh, You're taking notes. Oh. Well, I just I always write so that I don't forget stuff I want to say. Yeah, um, yeah. You mentioned the um, you, you mentioned about being like uh, entertaining uh, versus like educating somebody. Uh, this is an issue that I for a long time I thought that you know making reasonable arguments was just more difficult because there were so many facts and figures to get out, and making dumber arguments was easier. But I realized when I like analyzed the media environment more, I just think the right is very good. Well, in America, I talk about the right, but the people that work, on, especially on these populist sides, maybe you could say they're very good at making their stuff very palatable, like very entertaining, very uh, you know slogan worthy, buzz lines or. Um, buzzwords or whatever. And I think that you can do that on, on the factual side. You just have to actually put effort into doing it. But I think, like you said, people kind of assume that... Wait, hello? Oh my God, f*** me. Yeah, I didn't know what happened there, so... No, that was... You were saying? Sorry, that was my fault, 100%. Okay, <laughs> can you hear me? Uh, oh, oh, right. Oh, good. Vindicated. Yeah. Uh, yeah, nah, I can hear you fine. My bad. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just, I agree with your point that like people on the factual side need to do a better job at information presentation. They need to lean into better rhetorics. They need to lean into the narrative driven stories. They can't just assume that just because they're correct or they think they're correct, that that's enough to, to win the argument. It's a really uh, big mistake. I think that some sides of uh, politics or policy have made over the years in the United States. I think the left had a big issue with this where they just assume because we're correct and we've got the facts on our side, we don't have to make any of our stuff, uh, you know, entertaining or understandable. It's just enough to be right, which I think is dumb. Um, I think that this, it, 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 this is informed by or plays into a larger problem where I think that the world has been relatively at ease so much over the past several decades and the, uh, the, the world has benefited so much from certain things without seeing what it would look like otherwise. So I'm, talking broadly about things like globalization, that I think that the systems have become so complicated that it's easy to take them for granted and not understand what's happening. And that's why you get people that will say, we need to totally disengage, we need to be an autarky, no more trade, we need to be as protectionist and isolationist as possible, no more foreign intervention, uh, no more European Union, no more part of these multilateral trade, no more, no TPP, no any of this stuff, like everybody just wants to exit everything because when they don't have a good understanding of what they're even getting from these things, and then they have problems that are really difficult to solve or really difficult to even understand what they are, uh, it's fun sometimes to just point to one particular thing and say, we need to leave that. I, I think that all of our issues right now with employment uh, are caused by immigrants, right? People will say this in the United States. People in the US will say things like immigrants are stealing our jobs and it's destroying the job market when unemployment is at like 3.3%, right? They'll say these things. And it's like this, nothing even tracks with reality here. Um, I think that another issue, uh, we, we kind of, at the beginning, I'm going back through what I took notes on. Uh, one of the issues with the multipolar conversations, I think, is a lot of people in the United States and maybe even around the world don't even have a clear idea anymore of what the United States should be. Uh, you know, ever since 91, the Soviet Union has gone. Um, I, you have a couple of like NATO missions that are also kind of replaceable with like UN led coalitions. And it's like, well, does NATO really have a job? We're not sure. Uh, in the United States, we're so divided against ourselves. We also don't have any idea of what America should be. You know, in my generation, I'm 35. You know, I was just told over and over again, we, we're acting like the world police. We don't need the world police. We don't need to be the world police. We don't need to go police everybody. It's, we don't have uh, the moral authority. We screwed up in Iraq. We should just let everybody else figure out their own stuff. And I think as a result of that, since the United States internally doesn't know how we want to present ourselves uh, externally anymore. I think I, I, it feels like I remember Angela Merkel made that statement of the that Europe can't rely on the United States anymore. I don't know what the rest of the world looks at the United States and thinks when, you know, when you've got Obama signing, you know, a deal with Iran for nuclear weapons and then Trump, you know, walks it back immediately as soon as he gets into office and then Trump is making big promises to the Israelis and then you get, you know, a conflict and then you've got uh, Biden comes in and it's like, okay, well, now Israel needs to calm down in their war. Like, it feels like because America is so schizophrenic with what's happening internally and because we don't really know what we even want our role to be, the rest of the world doesn't really know what America's role is going to be and the rest of the world seems like at least the Western world doesn't know what anybody's role should be. And then as Russia and China, um, you know, and BRICS, you know, are, are kind of trying to grow and, and, and have their place in the world. Yeah, I feel like the West is just very lost and confused right now because because things are so complicated that nobody knows what anything does. And because um, we don't really know what we want to do or what we should be doing or how anything works or what our role even should be. I, I feel like these are big 
yeah, big issues. The Brexit thing, I think, was a good example where, um, you know, I, I'll talk to, I would talk to Brits who would talk about how important it was to have control over British immigration, and I'll ask them about like the, like the Schengen, like the movement zone. Like, do you know anything about that? And they're like, I've never heard of this before in my life. And it's like, okay, well, you guys aren't even a part of that. Are you aware of that? It's like, I don't know, I don't know anything about this. We don't control our borders. And it's like, oh, okay, um, and, and yeah, just like everything is so based in, in kind of like this emotive post fact. Like, we just need to separate. You know, we want our three hundred and 30 million quid per year going to, uh, you know, the NHS. And that's going to happen if we leave the European Union for sure. And we don't get any benefits from this. And uh, yeah, it's very, very, very frustrating. Um, yeah, I don't know where you want to, sorry, no, we're I mean, very broad. We're yeah. sweeping on a lot of things. Yeah. Well, no, but that's, that's the point. I, I think that was, you know, I, I, you know, I think this is the, hopefully the basis of, of, of more chats to come um, or debates or, or discussions or whatever. But yeah, um, no, I, I, I think that, you know, again, we can talk about the United States. It, it was in its primacy or it had primacy in the 90s to the early 2000s. Right. Um, the idea of an of a well, I, I've spoken to Francis Fukuyama in the past and, you know, he's the author of a very infamous book that some of your viewers may know called The End of History. Obviously, it doesn't mean the literal end of history, but it was the idea that any other political system other than liberal democracy, particularly that based on the Western model, uh, was, you know, we the, the dem that democratic model had come out as the uh, as the victor. Um, and what clearly illustrated that was that it didn't. China was very quickly sort of there was an arrogance, I think, in the West in that sort of there were no potential opportunities or alternatives. And China very quickly illustrated that when they joined or invited to join the WTO in 2001, there was this sort of a sense that, oh, well, they've they've liberalized their economy. Now they're going to liberalize their politics. And they didn't. Um, and they've kept that centralist control. There are obviously factions within the CCP and, and, and there's a lot of fighting as well, which people don't seem to appreciate how much there is actually in fighting sometimes. But um, they didn't. And this was the beginning of an illustration that countries were like, oh, well, hmm, we have options here. And I think that as time has gone on, equally, the you mentioned globalization. People seem to misunderstand that globalization isn't a one singular event. It's happened in waves. We can look, we can look to the mercantilism of the 15, 1600s when, you know, the, the Europeans were exploring the new world. And, and that was a form of globalization. You can talk about the um, the arms race between the English and the Germans in the early to early 1900s, right? Prior to the interwar period and mass isolationism and, and, and more protectionist policies, there was actually a hell of a load of trade going on and around Europe, which is why so many European states were able to industrialize and militarize in the extent they were before the second uh, the first world war. So, you know, what's different about this one is the integration the acceleration the intensity the magnitude of um of globalization and there was an interesting book i read by um an academic at the council on foreign relations or cfr which uh illustrates sort of the the, the myth of globalization which sort of she was arguing and i, I really liked it because i sort of I, I find globalization theory really interesting um and she was arguing that there's never really been true globalization right this there's three schools in in globalization theory for, for audience members globalists or hyper globalists so people are like world economic film you know become a borderless stateless world with homogenization and all that sort of stuff i'm definitely not about that um reform um uh, uh regionalists or skeptics people who believe that you know countries are primarily put into different blocks a bit like george orwell's 1984 you have the eurasia block you have the americas block and then you have the the other one right um and obviously the countries primarily just purely on pragmatic and geographical reasons trade with their near abroad um and we can see some of this playing out in this whole biden policy of reshoring friendshoring this idea that we need to decouple or de-risk from the Chinese um, and why Biden's, you know, had a lot of summits in Mexico and Canada and, and Latin America to try to bring on this idea that we need to produce more. Obviously, we have to continue to trade, but more closer to home and less reliant on uh, media adversaries. And then the third school is transformationalists, which basically argue that the nation state will be forever the main way that we, um, um, you know, society is constructed. Um, but that the nation state 
does undergo more challenges from MNCs, you know, from big tech, from um, non-state actors like Hezbollah or something, right? You know, Hezbollah doesn't govern Lebanon legally speak well you know at least recognized but it does have a bloody big influence so um these sorts of these sorts of things so uh, and i think globalization has been under a huge um challenge and shift and and just regression in some ways ever since 2008 obviously there's not one singular event but 2000 enough 2008 was enough of an inflection point whereby um you know the cracks began to show uh, to bring it back to the original point about u.s primacy um uh, and 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 at the same time, you're talking, when you just up. to be clear, when you reference 2008, are you talking about the fallout the because of how integrated we all are financially and the fallout from the 2007 U.S. housing market collapse? Or yeah, yeah, yeah okay, the, the okay. global finan- yeah the GFC the global financial crisis. Yeah, okay, yes. The point I'm making is that you know up until that point, the U.S. had been the hyperpower, mm-hmm. right? Had been the hegemon in comprehensive terms, economic, militarily, uh, politically, culturally, or, or whatever, um, uh, comprehensively, and you know, 2008 was the big shock that knocked one of the most important components, which was the economic supremacy. Um, and at the same time, you've got China hosting the Beijing Olympics. Russia's just invaded Ukraine. Sh- shit's beginning to change. Then 2010, 11, you get the uh, EU sovereign debt crisis, right? Where you've got when Greece... uh, a single market. Yeah, yeah. But you've got a single market where you've got Greece, which needs X amount of fiscal contractionary policy versus um or or monetary right you know versus the complete opposite of the powerhouse that is germany so you've got this direct confliction whereby the eu has to sacrifice the greeks to save the more well the overall single market but that puts greece in absolute austerity absolute dungeon uh, you know the doldrums um and people like hate you eu fuck you um and that's why you get pop and this is the surge of populism begins coming because you've got a far left government coming in in greece you've got um, anti-sentiment, anti-establishment sentiments beginning to develop uh, in Europe and, and America as well. You know, remember the Tea Party when we thought that was extreme in the US, right? Trump makes that look like it's a, a friggin' moderate middle ground in some ways. So uh, all these things basically are happening simultaneously. And this is causing more deglobalization sentiments. There was a really um, good, when I went to university in my first year in 2012, there was a really powerful movement called the Occupy movement. And you you probably remember it. Um, They occupied literally Wall Street, London Stock Exchange, lots of different financial centers. And it was, this was the first beginning of like, we're anti-globalization, we're anti-neoliberal policies. Um, and all this began to happen very, very rapidly. And, and, and then it snowballed. And the accumulation of that, if you like, the culmination of that was um, Brexit, for the UK at least, and Trump. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and then obviously the latter 2010s was sort of the the remnants of that or having to deal with that and uh, i anyway, feel like for so, i feel like for brexit I, I feel like the um 2013 the syrian crisis and the huge wave of immigrants that came from or refugees that came from syria through europe also i think played into the brexit and everything as well oh, and a oh, lot of the rise of kind of yeah. like parties across yeah well no immigration was immigration is always my undergrad was in demography i did my master's uh, my my dissertation in irregular migration and how it is weaponized by certain politicians and entities for political narratives and and games and i was living in australia at the time so i used australia as a case study but it, the, the same principles apply to europe to america to to the uk in that immigration has always happened people will always move there are just different reasons than as to why they move and to what extent that they stay the idea the concept of return migration is a very popular one i used poland earlier but the thing is the number one reason people move is for economics they want to better their economic opportunities which be that through education or economic um uh, employment and then after a certain amount of time they build up the skills they built up the net basis of of experience they go home because they want to be with their friends. They want to go with their fam- family. They want to be with their familiar, you know, history and culture and, and customs. So, you know, I, I'm not, and, and I want to make this very clear that this doesn't make me 100% like support of migration. I have huge issues with the mass migration, irregular migration in the UK at the moment. Um, and, and, and every country has a right to control its borders. But to sort of s- generally, sweepingly generalize all migrants as being some sort of, you know, well, that they eat pets, um, is uh, is uh, is a new one on me. So anyway, yeah, I feel I'll, like one I'll, of the 
I feel like one of the big issues, um, you kind of mentioned it before with this like post-fact world. I feel like one of the big things that's frustrating when you talk about any of the issues that you're bringing up, whether we're talking immigration, um, whether we're talking uh, economics or trade or whatever, uh, people have a very one-dimensional, it's not even one-dimensional, it's just like retard-dimensional. Like, like people will look at a thing and they'll just think it's completely and totally bad. Uh, or they'll look at one thing and they'll say, oh, this is a bad thing. Rather than, there are pros and cons basically with with everything, right? There, there are pros to manufacturing things closer to home, right? You could argue for national security reasons, you could argue for, um, you know, protecting, you know, local industry or local employment for some time, like there are pros to having things manufactured at home, but there are also cons to manufacturing these things at home that usually cost more, right? There's a reason why you export your supply chains is because they can make it your comparative advantage or whatever, they can make it for way cheaper in other countries. But it feels like when I'm hearing people talk about these things, they want everything. They want to, like people will say, we need to manufacture things at home, uh, and it's going to be cheaper at the same time. Or we need to, you know, like uh, the, on the the Kamala administration wants to say we need to give uh, we need to forgive student loan debt, and we need to give twenty five thousand dollars to first time home buyers to make homes more affordable. And okay, well that's also going to drive up the cost of homes a ton. Uh, like you can't these things can't happen. You know, it, it, these things are always going to happen in parallel with each other. There's always pros and cons to everything. Um, the uh, or or you br you bring up like Greece and monetary policy is always fun because really the only people online that talk monetary policy are usually uh, people that believe in like gold standards. I, I don't know where you're at on that. I'm not sure. Um, but then it's, <laughs> it's funny that you uh, it's funny that you bring up you know a, a frustrating issue with Greece and the EU and. Um, I'm not as well studied in that issue, but I, I'm, I'm broadly familiar uh, with the idea of the importance of having control over your currency and the idea that there are times when you want to you want to have a more inflationary currency and you want to have less inflationary currency and you want to be able to control your monetary policy. And man, it sure does feel weird when you're in a union with other countries that are having economies that are experiencing different things than yours and you would like you know some kind of like monetary contraction or whatever and they don't and now you're completely beholden to some other monetary policy. But all of the people that would argue against that would argue against central banking they would say oh well that's good see they all need to go back to the gold standard and that'd be you know great for everybody and it's like okay well that's that doesn't help anything there's a reason why everybody has central banking now um the the the, the post fact stuff you kind of brought this up um maybe we can hone yeah. in on an area uh i feel like we are in a i feel like we're in a uniquely bad I, i'm sure everybody's always said this i hate saying this is uniquely bad because like all throughout history everybody's always said this music is worse today than it ever has been and people are meaner today than ever have been like everybody always says this but Especially with the internet and with, with all the interconnectedness we have now, which I think is unique, right? People are, are more connected to everybody across the world in a way they never have been. And now, like, through borders, right? Like, a Russian can be, you know, funding media companies in the United States and so nobody would know about it. What do you think is the path from here? What do you think is happening? What do you think should happen to combat the horrendous amount of not different opinions, but just, like, blatant disinformation that is pushed across the entirety of the internet right now? Yeah, it's um, uh, just before I answer that, I just wanted to make a couple things. So, so firstly, what you're talking about, you know, how we think about the times that it was always the grass was greener to quote Pink Floyd or rose tinted glasses, right? Um, you make me think of a quote by Orwell, um, George Orwell, who's one of my favorite just individuals, but who is being insulted by people who take it what he meant and what he says and what he thought about with this sort of idea of freedom of speech and, and control and all this stuff. It's completely taken to, well, again, exaggerated and misrepresented by people on, 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 on well, X and certain communities. But his quote, each generation imagines itself to be more intelligent than the one uh, that went before it and wiser than the one that comes after it. And so the same kind of principles can be applied that, oh, my God, in my day, music was so much better. Or today's stuff is crap. Um, or the same with, you know, I always had it better economically and, and, and certain things. But the other point was just about the EU. Um, so the EU is a really interesting thing because conceptually, as I said before, I really agree with it. I think it's a, well, I love the idea of being able to live in Spain and then freely travel to Denmark and stay there for a couple of months. I think that's really cool. The problem is that it has moved too fast and too far right we have i don't know let's say more or less 40 nations within the euro european union and 23 25 i think in the eurozone mm -hmm. around 20 something like that um 
the problem and then is just for just to sorry because sometimes um no no so, yeah european union is all of the countries that are a part of the giant body that has like a parliament that could vote on yeah. things the eurozone means that you use the um the euro as your currency yeah. as your state's currency right now. yeah mm -hmm. so the european union is the entire thing and then you've got subsets within it which and the eurozone is the most the levels of integration that's what we're trying to that's what i'm coming to yeah uh, so the eurozone is the most integrated that you can be right so norway has this unique model where it's part of the schengen area which is the freedom of movement thing mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily part of the eurozone um britain was in a very unique position we were the only country with a veto on opt-out if we didn't like a policy we could veto it it had to go back and we had to change it um so that it you know met the uk's special needs um and um and and you know so and we didn't have the currency yeah uh, the no eurozone. eurozone and no schengen uh, agreement as well so britain yeah. it was like a, it was one of the saddest things i think about brexit is i don't know if the brits that all voted in favor of it knew how enviable the position was for the uk in uh, the European yeah. Union, because it's like the ultimate hack position where you have a say on everything that runs through the European Parliament, but you're not beholden to anything having to do with the euro or with the movement stuff. And that that, that was such a beneficial position to be in. Yeah. And, and, and there's, a, there's, there's one more than that as well, uh, as well, which is that in the 1980s, Thatcher and a lot of people assume if you're conservative or more right leaning, you're, you know, skeptical of the EU or you're more anti the EU or just generally Thatcher was actually a huge fan of the EU in some ways, and she negotiated what, what, what was known as rebates. So every country within the Euro, the European Union, contributes money, and you're either a, excuse me, net contributor or you're a net recipient. So the big economies tend to be net contributors because they, well, they're, they're wealthier. Mm -hmm. So the Netherlands, France, Germany, and so on, Britain. Uh, and then, you know, other countries are net recipients. Britain was a net contributor, but due to the rebates that Thatcher negotiated, we got actually a huge fuck ton of that money being reinvested in the UK in certain areas like in the north, in Wales, in underdeveloped areas, you know, not in the southeast or London. Um, and, and since then, since Brexit, you've seen a marked uh, shift in in um well the quality the high streets have shut down birmingham council the second largest city in this country one and a half two million people went bankrupt we've got local governments going bankrupt and that was because they were benefiting so much from the european um you know rebates anyway so the point i'm making is that you've got this entire system within the eu which is very um complex very complex and people do entire you know degrees phds in just one area of european law or european policy um but the problem is that we haven't spent enough time ironing out the existing issues within countries right there's not a standardization of countries within the eurozone which have you know greece has a one of the largest if not the largest gdp debt to deficit ratios right um versus you know germany which was running a budget surplus how are you supposed to create a standardized monetary policy because if you join the eurozone you give up some of your monetary decisions to the ecb or european central bank that's what you do right and the problem is it's not you're either all in or you're not and because the European Union and the Eurozone hasn't fully integrated fiscal policy as well, governments can spend whatever the hell they want on domestic issues. There's a massive disconnect and disparity between domestic governments and fiscal responsibility, taxes and, and spending, versus monetary policy, which is done at the supranational level in Brussels and the ECB. So, um, you know, and, and, and this is the structural just flaw of the current EU system and structure, and it's not going to be solved overnight. And it came to fruition in 2011-12 with the sovereign debt crisis. Mm -hmm. Obviously, things have improved, but the problem is that existing countries that remain poor, like Croatia, best example, and then I'll move on to your existing question about disinformation. Croatia I went there earlier this year, um, and you know I've been there a few times. And Croatia in 2013 joined the Euro European Union. But they still had the 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 what I can't remember the name of their currency, right? Um, and the, the 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 Croats were really excited. They benefited so much from the new investment that was coming in. Obviously, the Schengen area. Twenty tens was you know all Americans were coming over. They were like, oh, I've been to Split, I've been to Dubrovnik, Game of Thrones, right? It was it was Croatia's decade for for tourism. However, last year they joined the eurozone, and what that has done is pushed. Uh, the price level for basic goods up by like i think for bread like four times 
And for average Croats that don't earn, the problem is they don't earn the same amount as other countries in Western Europe do. It, 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 it's, it's priced them out. The market has priced them out. And so the uh, the country is struggling now with this uh, this, this transition. Um, and again, because you've got such diversity in the different economies, um, income categories, needs and, and wants and everything. So the EU is, is a mess um, in its execution, in its concept. It's there. But again, you know, I want them to slow down. They're thinking about, you know, integrating the Ukrainians and the Moldovians. And I'm not against them in principle, obviously, after what's happened. Mm -hmm. But Jesus Christ, the Ukrainians earn an average of three to four thousand dollars a year. The average income of um, uh, the Russia, uh, the, the Germans or the Brits is fifty five, sixty. How are you supposed to balance this economic disparity in a in a in a mono, uh, you know a singular system in a single market or whatever? Uh, as to your question about disinformation, I think that um, some of the best ways is exposure. Um, one of the best things we did when China was interfering in U.S. elections, for wait, example, was before. Okay, wait. Actually, before you address the. Um the question yeah, yeah, one of the when you when you bring up the economic things i'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this one, one of the biggest triggers that i have is especially now when i'm listening to populists talk about econ uh, i feel like a lot of people are under the kind of this misunderstanding that all of economics is a zero-sum game so i feel like it drives a lot of the if this country's doing good like you hear this in, with trump a lot they got a good deal on us so they're you know they must be beating us like people talk about these like you're doing a one, one to one business transactions where somebody could get screwed over or somebody is benefiting or something but um yeah people have this really hard time understanding that multiple economies can all come together and engage in deals that's actually benefiting everybody if people feel very much like like if you're brexiting like if you're part of the european union like you spoke about that sending money uh you know whether you, you have a surplus or whether you send something or get something back people talked about that as though britain is just losing right the, the united kingdom was just sending money for nothing to the european union if they leave well the Euro european union might be a little bit worse off but britain is now winning because the european union might be worse off that means that the united kingdom is winning now and i feel like in the united states this happens a lot too if immigrants come over and they're winning that means they're taking things from natives which means we're losing and if we trade with china that means they're winning and we're losing like I, that thought i feel like is very pervasive amongst a lot of especially populist uh citizens or supporters across the world right now yeah, hundred percent. I'm I'm reading in the comments. People are like, "Is this a debate or a conversation?" So um, I do want you to, you know, push back or or, or you know, um, I don't want to just be lecturing. Oh, you're um, the guy that came on before you was wondering if he was gay because he got fucked in the ass by a trans lady in Thailand. So you're, we're my content on stream is all over the place. Okay, so don't worry about it. Fuck the content. Uh, don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, okay. We're good. Don't a, worry. I've got a, I'm sure, I want to follow that in the future. <laughs> yeah, um, we're fine. Steve. We're all over uh, the place. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Oh, apparently, um, I just hope I'm not too vanilla for some viewers. But anyway, um, no, I mean, I, you know, I, I like uh, spicy things, but maybe not that. I've actually got some spicy pizza on your teeth. And, but anyway, um, um, yeah, I think that um, I, I, I'd answer your question this way in that I've, I've alluded to it a few times, but like people will probably hear me and say, oh, he's worked for the World Bank, he's done X, Y, and Z. He's the most quintessential, conventional X, Y, and Z person, establishment type. But I'm not, because I very much don't like um, neoliberal policy. I do believe that some degree of protectionism is important. Isolationism is complete bollocks. Autarkism, as you said, autarkic states don't exist. North Korea does 90% of its trade with the, Russia, uh, with the Chinese. OK, uh, North Korea cannot self-sustain um, um, entirely. OK, Cuba cannot self-sustain entirely. There is no country that exists that is autarkic. Right. It's, uh -huh. it's a flawed concept, and a stupid one. Um, and this idea that we can isolate. And, and this is the other point that I find it sort of interlates with the disinformation we'll come to in a second which I always find quite amusing, is the naivety, the ignorancy of people within, shall we say, um, some people who support Trump or have been um, misled by Trump because they say, oh, we need to stop getting involved in foreign issues. 100% with you there. It goes back to what you're asking about. I think the West is going into an internal um, uh, reflection. Uh, about itself right no longer are we going to see the days of liberal interventionism or forever wars that is over um but there's a misguidedness in, un in there's a spectrum this is a video i intend to do actually about different types of u.s foreign policy and what i consider to be a better path going forward but there's a difference between having restraint and all-out engagement or interventionism um 
the United States needs to find a balance between being active on the world stage, but also interfering in domestic countries' affairs where, you know, you may well think that the country should be a democracy, but sticking your nose in there is only going to lead to um, regressive results and or be counterproductive. Um, and, and the naivety is that people seem to think that by stopping our engagement in the Middle East, in um, uh, Ukraine, in Taiwan, somehow that's going to be reciprocated by the Chinese, by the Kremlin, mm -hmm. by Tehran and the Mullahs. That's not how it works, guys. You can you can stop all your, you know, you can stop trying to protect uh, American interests, but it will still, it won't mean that the Chinese and the Russians don't continue to interfere in American affairs because they want to down, pull you down a peg or two. They want to see the United States weakened. And so this sort of, vacuum that people seem to think that you know by by being isolationist that that will somehow mean all their problems are gone and that everything's hunky-dory and and the, and the ccp and the kremlin are somehow suddenly oh yeah that's fine america's not interfering yeah we'll let them still be the most but uh-huh yeah right um so uh, yeah we need to move past that and i think when it comes to the economics thing you know I, we've got a lot of issues that are well, Britain again. We've got a an average income of this country that has been stripped by way outstripped by wages since two thousand and eight. Um, the average income within London is about thirty one thousand uh, pounds. So what thirty seven, thirty six thousand dollars? I'm not sure entirely of the um, of the exchange rate. But point is, the average sort of house price in this city is about four hundred thousand pounds. So what five six hundred like basically more than ten times the price um or the average income so um th there is a huge issue in this country that, that we have austerity there is lack of growth there is lack of productivity in the uk um which is the most important i think there's a people come to the uk to create the, their ideas but they, they outsource the productivity and the actual development of those ideas in other countries because it's cheaper so uh, in America, you guys have one strength, which is just your sheer size. Uh, there's an old econo economist called uh, Alfred Marshall, and he talked about economic agglomeration, which was basically that sort of certain settlements become hubs for certain industries. So think Silicon Valley for you know high end tech, um, you know uh, the, the Detroit in the uh, in the you know 70s, 60s for car design and development and things like that. So you've got lots of hotspots like that, and, and what America needs to do better is integrating them. Right, you don't have a public transport system that is effective yeah. in that way. Um, so so I, I think yeah. So the West has a lot to do, I think, in terms of finding not just consist um, more um, refining growth in terms of trade and other things, but consist sustainable growth. Um, that lasts longer, um, and you know the the the, the 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 as I say, the U.S. has that benefit, which ultimately will um, power it through. Whilst the EU, our forecast by the IMF and other entities, is not good. It's like what half a percent, one percent minus if you're Britain. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, there is not one. There's no one shoes fits all approach and, and solution. Um, but I think that we need to almost bring some industries on shore again or back home because at the end of the day manufacturing is a huge you know if you're too what britain i think has proven to us is that a, 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 a an economy almost too dependent on entirely or based on services doesn't have a longevity to it and you need to be selling stuff not just services but physical products right britain we used to have a booming car manufacturing industry we used to have a booming um textiles and and stuff obviously some of it's changing with climate change policy but the point is we need to reclaim some of that in-house dom domestic production mm -hmm. um and uh, but that's not going to happen overnight and um you know you are my age i think right? our generation yeah. is going to struggling with that right we're at the we're in the difficult phases of that anyway what do you think are we f um what do we what do i think are we <laughs> i mean you know better than i do um yeah like i said i don't um i don't think you've said anything i, I super disagree with or anything so far um yeah i would just add that for most stuff i just wish people the, the biggest issue, I, I, it goes back to the, and I, we can circle back around to this and then you can give a better answer for the disinformation stuff. Um, people just aren't willing to, to realize the pros or cons of anything. And if you can't talk about both sides of an issue, then you can't even talk about the issue. And then you can't talk about what you might begin to do to solve a particular problem, right? So like, I, I agree with you 
uh, in, in, I agree with you in theory and principle. I, I don't know as much in practice because I haven't studied or know much about the economy of the European Union other than like broadly how, you know, like the ECB works, everything. Um, the the idea that you might protect some industry uh, because there, even if even if there is a short term uh, negative impact, and you do have to pay greater prices, and your products might be a little bit worse, or whatever, for the long term growth of an industry that now you can export to the rest of the world. You know, I, I'm pretty sure Japan did this in growing a lot of their electronics industries, and it served them very well. Um, the idea that um, the idea that you can do this to grow an industry to do that, like that, these are all good ideas if you recognize the pros and cons, and then you can you know advocate for them effectively. Because if the citizens aren't on board with that, if they don't understand exactly what's happening, right? As soon as you start to make that investment, as soon as prices start to go up, you know, people bail, you lose your elections, and now you're off to some other stupid track. And a lot of the people that are advocating for those protectionist policies aren't doing so with this pro and con balance in mind. They're doing it with the autarky example in mind. It's like, oh, we can just make all of our own stuff. We don't need any other country, and we'll be totally fine. And I was like, okay, well, the people advocating then for the ideas of doing at-home manufacturing are, are the dumbest citizens. Um, and so the kind of support that you'll find for those aren't going to be beneficial for a long-term growth of your country. It's just going to be, you know, I guess like what Brexit was, which was not good. <laughs> it didn't really help at all, um, which a lot of people said, right? There's like a very clear and easy through line where people were saying, well, if we Brexit, it's probably going to be really bad because for a whole bunch of reasons, we're losing integration with the European market, the, the EU market. We, we Now we have no say in their policies whatsoever. Uh, all of these things are gonna be bad it's like okay well let's see what happens and then well now we're seeing we saw and we are continuing to see what's happened and it just wasn't a good idea um yeah so that the that's very annoying a driver behind a lot of this is um there's a lot of different drivers but the one thing going back to the the disinformation thing is man there are so many people i, I don't mind when citizens are saying stupid things because I, I at the end of the day i understand it things are complicated you don't have all day to sit on the internet and research every topic and know all like that's fine i get it but man it feels like there are so many commentators especially in alternative media that just lie about everything and it's very frustrating that the the discourse is so destroyed and it's so challenging to deal with it because even even the idea of dealing with disinformation, I feel like you've already lost by the time you're trying to debunk stuff because now instead of talking about, well, why might it be good to protect some local industry? Why might globalism benefit you in some ways? You know, why might it be good to have control of your currency or not? Now instead it's like, well, now we have to debunk the idea that printing money is just bad and you should never do it or we need a gold standard or tr trade deficits are always bad or inflation is always bad or what, now it's like, even when you debunk these things successfully, you've wasted all of your oxygen talking about the dumbest things ever and nothing is actually getting done. Nobody's getting informed on anything. And then it's just to the next talking point the next day. Yeah, people don't, people don't talk to people. They talk past people um, when they get angry about something. You know, when, when um, I, I promise, you know, we will actually address your original disinformation question because mm -hmm. I know people are like, what the hell are they ever going to get to it? Um, when Musk first bought X, you know, I always try to remain open minded, um, give a benefit of the doubt, a skeptical, but perhaps, um, you know, still willing benefit of the doubt. And when I was on one of Mario Nafour's spaces oh, man. Uh, in the early days before he went, you know, as big as he is or whatever, um, I was on stage when Musk was joining and I, I chatted to Musk, you know, on and off briefly in that. And I've still got the recording somewhere. But anyway, you know, I asked him, how are you going to balance when there's, it was, it was during the protests in China, what was called the white paper revolutions after the, the basically the Chinese population were getting fed up with these um, zero COVID policies and were, you know, very rarely for once going out on the streets. And I was saying, you know, how are you going to ensure the, you know, things around like China and what we're seeing there and the truth and the information around that is not being, um, exaggerated sensationalized and, and so on obviously in hindsight this was all incredibly stupid of me and naive to us but um at the time and he simply just said you know we will we will do it not do it we will not allow anything that breaks the law or something he's very definitive um right well anyway um 10 you know 22 months on and or 21 months on and um i think x is a i'm using x as a case study right for disinformation because it's just it's it's I know I'm more sad almost than anything because it's just full of fuckwits and I as I said I have quite a high bar threshold tolerance level for um, um, idiocy 
or people who have a you know nefarious agenda, right? I, I understand that people are anti-NATO. I understand that people feel, I include myself, as I said, um, in that Russia feels that its interests are being threatened or being surrounded. Does that make it a justification for invading Ukraine? No, it doesn't. But the conflation and the extremities that people take some of these issues to are like, we're literally having debates now whether or not Hitler was a good guy. Yeah. What the fuck is going on? Mm -hmm. Like, we are, you know, I don't know. I, I'm tr I don't even know what to say about it. You know, people are, people who stand up for the absolute free speech sort of stuff, any one of those names, you know, they're spinning in their grades. It's an insult to people who truly stand for freedom of speech because freedom of speech is not, and it comes to this in, disinformation thing, it's not something that is free of consequences, but... And, and there is no such thing as freedom of speech absolutism. It isn't. Even Musk is not a freedom of speech absolutist. Remember when he had that whole um, fan fed him around the plane? Yeah, and they the guy had to track this plane, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. it, it's just hypocrisy. And obviously it's, it's, only a, it's only okay as long as it doesn't affect the person who's talking about it. And so when it comes into disinformation, we just... Um, we're not just racing history completely just it's not just even revisionist i don't know i, I want to use a more extreme word it's just so farcical um you know the accounts that i come across yet another day where some grifter some kid on a sofa and i'm not saying that you can't have an opinion about it but when someone is literally influencing a battlefield where lives are being changed be them on the Russian side or the Ukrainian side. It's, I'm, I'm not taking sides at this point. I'm just simply saying people are dying for this and you on your cushy little sofa somewhere far away have the audacity to make up this shit about something that you probably didn't even know existed before the second um, you know, day of the war and now you suddenly give a shit about the lives lost by the Russians? Fuck off, you do. Uh -huh. Can you tell me where Yekaterinburg is? Can you tell me where uh, Rostov von Don is? Can you tell me about the relationship of the Kievan Rus and the Ukrainians to the Russians, please? And as soon as you start picking them up on details, um, they can't. But because details require a little bit more time to express, people get bored and they're like, oh, it's just a shill. He's just working for the... Um, you know, I've been labelled a. You asked me earlier. I've been uh, labelled a NATO shill. I'm a. I'm a Zionist. I'm a. I'm a hardcore Palestinian uh, Islamist. I am everything under this. I'm a member of the Taliban. Apparently, I work for ISI in Pakistan, um, and I also am a globalist. Uh, you know, who who likes the World Economic Forum. So you know, it, it, it's just you'll be labelled something by everybody, but particularly people who push these disinformation narratives. Um, it's really hard to find ways to counteract it. But um, before you ask me the question about the economy, um, I was going to mention one example, which I thought was quite interesting, which is that, you know, when the Chinese or the Russians interfere in domestic issues, be the, be the election in 2016, one of the most effective ways um, at the time that the US found was to just publicize it, to make it very vocalized, not, not, not necessarily add all this, you know, additional dressing and garnish of like how wrong it is, just simply put it out there for the world to see. And allow the international community, other countries, to make up their minds about, you know, how fucked up this is. Um, and it did work. It, it, it does it does alienate. It does um, uh, deter. It's a good deterrence. Um, the other example is, and I don't give a shit about people who are like, oh, you've um, you've exposed them. You're 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 um, you're crassing. What's the expression? You're you're you know, you're dossing them. Okay. Right. Uh, you're yeah. doxing them. Yeah, yeah. You're doxing them. I don't give a shit. Right. The best example is this. Um, this Sarah girl, I think that's her name, you know, the one who was the DD, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's an account called DD, um, the, the Bushkra or something, right? It was, it was covered in people, if they want to look up, they can look up, you know, a uh, former Navy officer who was exposed as pretending to be a, a Russian, Ukrainian, a local, but she's actually living in California. Mm -hmm. Uh, she runs an account now called DD Geopolitics. But anyway, she was a, she was a grifter. She's just a girl from, um, I know, Southwest California in, in the US. And, and she found an opportunity to um, moonlight as a, as a, as a Russian Ukrainian local who was, you know, putting all this true information now about, you know, how the fact that the Russians are protecting the, the Ukrainians and, and the Ukrainians are killing off uh, any Russian aligned Ukrainians and, and preventing them from practicing their orthodoxy faith and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and, and, it, and it, you know, she was doxxed completely and people were like, how dare you dox this woman? You know, you've ruined her life. Well, maybe she had it coming. 
So that's another tactic which I I or don't even really feel much. Maybe maybe even to, more. Yeah, maybe even to get more particular on that, because um, I, I, I as an internet person, I, I view doxing as being a bad thing. <laughs> but but I think that people have a misunderstanding sometimes of, of, of what I would say that doxing is, and obviously I was going to fight. You shouldn't. If you what? have nothing to hide, you should be a being. You're not a bad actor, right? You have some opinions that people might not like, but I don't consider yourself to be, you know, sure. a disinformation agent. Well, so, personally, that's as an American, I don't agree with that statement. If you have nothing to hide, you should be fine being exposed. <laughs> okay, so fuck you, number one. But um, it's more just like a, I feel like people forget that doxing is doxing is when you place information about somebody online with the intent to harm or hurt that person, actually, um, and for no newsworthy right. purpose, right? So somebody posts, you know, with 100 followers on Twitter, God, I hate President Trump, he's such a loser, you know? And then you find this guy's place of employment, and then you post that in his home address and everything, that's doxing, it's bad. Oh, no, that's but I think that people don't understand yeah. that for newsworthy reasons, you want to know who your big communicators are. Like I've said this a million times in the United States, I feel like we should have a law where if you work in media, especially alternative media, if not publicly, at the very least to some government agency, you should have to disclose your income sources. I don't like, and especially now that these indictments have come out showing that at least six people are getting paid through a Russian company. I don't like the idea that you have these huge alternative media figures and I don't know who funds them. I don't know where any of their money comes from. I don't know how they can afford any of the stuff they do. Or even worse, you have totally anonymous accounts on social media that are in charge of a whole bunch of news consumption. And it's not that I even necessarily want to silence their speech or ban them, but I think it's important that we know who they are. I think that it's important to know that if you've got, if your mom, you know, my mom follows seven different crazy accounts on Twitter, I think it would be meaningful for me not to just say, mom, don't trust these accounts, but at least I'll say, mom, you know that like of these seven accounts, like four of these are ran by people that are in Moscow. Uh, the other two are Iranian accounts. And this one dude is some fucking retard in you know, Tennessee. Like, at least you know where they're from. You can believe them if you want. That's fine. But at least know who you're listening to. And yeah, that bothers me a ton that the the whole idea and people like abuse these, the First Amendment and freedom of speech and give a man a mask and he'll tell you the truth. And uh, anonymity is so important to have freedom of speech and be able to fight against the government. Yeah, but it can be abused as well. You know, like the idea that, uh, that, that infinite freedom of speech, the more you have, the better it can be in every single circumstance. That's not actually true. And the idea that now so many of these platforms are, are essentially run by these massive disinformation accounts, but you don't even know who these people are. You're assuming that this guy, I'm sure you saw the post where there was some account, uh, some Texas uh, voter guy who's like, yeah, I really like Texas. It's important that we support ourselves. We, you know, we have one of the only, like our warm water ports are so key to the United States. And I'm like, what? Excuse me? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's a joke that, yeah, I, the, the anonymous accounts, especially on platforms like X are, yeah, super triggering to me. It's like, Jesus, we, we should know who these are. That doesn't mean posting their full fucking address and like their social security number or something, no, but at no, least no, like know no, who no. the fuck they are and what country they're from. Yeah. Oh no! Well, you know, as as I, I as I was hoping and, and and haven't been disappointed, you know, we we're having a, a, a back and forth, but it's not like oh, you said it, and it's like you know, what about is um is my favorite. Another thing, actually, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. But like, yeah, no, I, I think that maybe doxing is the wrong term. Maybe it has a slightly different connotation in uh, in proper English. Um, sorry, British English. Um, and um, and um, no, but like you know the. Um, no, obviously, you don't want to expose every single thing about that. That is fucked up. But I don't think that people should be allowed to get away with what are sometimes truly heinous crimes. Um, and and severely, like, the war in Ukraine is the most documented, publicized, whatever word you want to use, war in history, right? And you might not like NAFO. I don't particularly like every single thing about the, uh, the this online community. Um, I've never really gotten the whole dog meme thing, um, which is why I don't have one. But, you know, it, it, it's been incredible for on the ground or open source intelligence gathering and provision of information to help the Ukrainians better understand. Because ultimately they are up in the odds against the, excuse me, bigger power. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and NAFA has single handedly helped. Excuse me, the beer's coming up. Um, you know, through through some issues, right? So, um, no, doxing maybe not in certain circumstances, but definitely. Oh, and actually, I, I, okay, let's completely change the the the. the uh, here's a curveball question for you, but mm -hmm. in this instance, you know, the revelations are our Mr. Beast and his empire, right? We're both YouTubers, <laughs> albeit you know, of different levels, right? Uh -huh. um, he's a very public person. He had all his income. Well, seemingly very publicized and freely accessible, 
but we're learning all sorts of, um, you know, uh, disconcerting things about that. So do you think that still making all your income publicized is going to solve the issue of sort of, you know, nefarious actors and disinformation? I mean, I, I think that there, and I don't know how you would do it exactly. Obviously, I don't know how you'd outline it exactly, but there are people that, regardless of how we would look at this on the edges, there are people that very clearly exist to deliver news and, and media, like like news to people, right? Who, who exist in media that do this. So somebody like like everybody who works for the Daily Wire or people like Candace Owens or people like me or you know people like Tim Pool. Very clearly, these people work in the media. I think that understanding- oh, Don't put yourself in the same bracket as Candace Owens, buddy. Yeah, I mean, that's alternative media. It's a, hor- it's a horrible <laughs> racket over here. It's absolutely terrible. Oh, God, does that make me alternative media? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it does. Well, you, do you work for CNN? Yeah. The, um, I, I think that, I mean, that would be just step one. I just, I think it would be good to know where the income, so I would feel better knowing, or at the very least it's tracked by some government uh, organization or, or, or subcommittee or whatever, just to know where the money's coming from, because yeah, like the, the, um, it's just too scary now, especially again, after, uh, after these recent indictments and seeing, sometimes I get so, I look at some of the talking points and I see so much like in lockstep communication about, uh, you know, especially stuff related to Russia and Ukraine. Um, and then, you know, I hear so many things behind the scenes and I've seen so many things and it's like, man, I, I wonder sometimes because now you have, it's like, we went from just having an environment where people disagreed and they exaggerated the truth or lied, you know, spreading misinformation to now we've got people that intentionally to grift spread disinformation. They've got unprecedented access to audiences all over the world. They're making millions of dollars doing it. And foreign governments can step in and kind of like, you know, push their, uh, you know, fingers and, and kind of like tilt the scales and, and apply pressure in certain areas as well. And that environment is, in my opinion, that environment is almost impossible for a good faith consumer to survive in, right? Like if you're a consumer, how the fuck do you turn on any media source and trust anything being said by anybody when, I mean, in my personal opinion, like the, the Republican party in the United States of America is is insane that you can't trust a single thing they say. So, but then let's say you hear me say that. It's like, okay, well, so Steven, you're saying I can only trust one political party. Well, how convenient for you, right? Oh, and it happens to be the one that you support. It's like, yeah, I guess, well, fuck me. I sound just like Tim Pool, except Tim Pool would say it's the right and I say it's the left, right? So how do you even begin to decide who's correct or who's incorrect to even begin to begin to even begin to begin that journey, you would already have to have some like base level of information. You know, could you imagine putting the the medical fact sheet of two different uh, vaccines in front of somebody and saying which one is the safe vaccine? I have no fucking idea. I don't even know how to how to start to to, to discern this information. And yeah, that's very frustrating. That it feels like the government right now has essentially no role in that. And and social media companies have been trying to figure out their role, but if they take a step in any direction, everybody's screaming at them that they're being too biased or they're bought and paid for by the government or they're, uh, you know, being too lenient to one side or, or they're letting too much misinformation come from the other side. And it's, I, I just don't know what the correct path forward is. Like, where do you even begin to make steps in the right direction? Yeah. So I'm giving a thumbs up to people who are saying nice to see us chatting. So cheers, guys. Hopefully this is I don't know, enjoyable for you guys. I'm not entirely sure if I should interact with people on the, I, I, I need to do more live streaming. Sure. Um, no, on your point, um, see, you're much more of a natural YouTuber than I am. I've got that awkward English sort of like, oh dear, you know, uh, slight um, aspect. Um, although I did do lots of theatrics growing up. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm being facetious, man. I don't really mean when I apologize. I was, uh, I don't know if your f- viewers will be familiar with Shakespeare, but I played bottom in uh, in Midsummer Night's Dream many years ago, and that was obviously my crowning achievement. And then my uh, creative director, when I gave her flowers at the end of our show series, said, um, "Well, you were just playing yourself," and I realized, "Bitch, don't like me." Um, like really late, right? So anyway, um, so I've got a I question. I said Midsummer Night's Dream, but I was that was a hilarious joke. But, but I, I hate Shakespeare, and I hate no, reading his plays. So, yeah. I think we, yeah, I know, no, but. I think we ended up doing um, the Merchant of Venice, I think, instead. It was like either one or the other, and it ro- rotates by year. So we did the, the anti Semitic. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. No, okay, it's, it's a wonderful piece. And mm-hmm. if, you, if you're ever in London, actually, um, or you come this, you know, you should go to the Globe. Uh, we should do like a live stream from, well, no, that won't go down well with the organizers, but we should, you know, go to the Globe and watch some Shakespeare. Anyway, um, yeah, so what I think uh, I want to ask you is um, about, you know, U.S. policy, like I, for me personally, you know, the abortion element is not even, I I was listening to the debate and it's just like the whole abortion thing. I just, it doesn't even get me. I I just don't, doesn't even rise. It's it's not even up for debate, I guess is what I would say. Um, And I think that what people think of that, therefore, is that sort of if you are, oh, this is, I'll, I'll rephrase it. Something that has been an underlying theme through some of what we've been saying is labels. People very much like to label you as one thing 
or label you as another, right? So because I support Ukraine in the sense of that it deserves to be a sovereign state with its existing borders, people label you as being a Western shill, a NATO shill. And it's like, no, I'm very problematic with, you know, Western hypocrisy, as we've acknowledged in the first, you know, previous um, back and forth earlier. Um, or because I support um, internationalism, not globalism, internationalism, I am a globalist. Because I've worked at the World Bank, I therefore support, you know, homogenization and, and limitless borders and everything, mass migration everywhere. No, no, definitely don't support that. But people like to simplify and make sweeping generalizations and, and everything and to be labeled. But anyway, so I don't particularly align to either party too much. Obviously, in the current circumstances, I'm a Democrat. But like, I don't agree with every detail of the Democrats in every way. Like, I do think, you know, there needs to be a, a change from this sort of continuation of moderate Democrat, which is sort of support Israel all the time or not ever call out certain policies in certain other areas, right? There needs to be a, a, a real revisit in, in terms of the US's approach to foreign issues, I think. But anyway, all that pretext aside, for you, um, you know, we have a party which has, you know, its issues and then a, not, and a, and a party that seemingly is increasingly unsalvageable, right? Um, what, what what's the future of the Republican Party, right? Let's pretend and hope that Kerr Harris wins in November. What happens to the GOP? I read one interesting article from the Economist or the Politico, I think it was, basically saying that JD Vance is being positioned as the sort of you know, uh, the, the, the 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 torchbearer after Trump. Uh, that's a bad idea. Even his own president doesn't like him. Mm -hmm. So what what do you see going forward? Uh, well, you know, only the Democrats and the Republicans implode. They go back to Mitt Romney and more <laughs> McCain traditional conservatism. What's going on? Yeah. So I think I feel like I feel like for a while that was the, the trillion dollar question. Like, what would the Republican Party look like after <laughs> Donald Trump? Um, something that I feel like after I finally like this year is probably the first year I've actually done real historical studying and and not just read, uh, you know, like, you know, quick articles or whatever on stuff. Uh, I, I truly do feel like there are individuals in history that are important that like the path of history isn't inevitable, but sometimes a, a person with strong ideas who is a leader can move people in a direction that they wouldn't have otherwise gone. Um, obviously, there is some sort of feedback mechanism, like a certain leader can only exist within a certain context, so the context needs to exist to support him, but that that leader can move you, you know, left or right, and, and these two things like act on each other. I feel like after Trump lost in 2020, uh, the entire, well, if you think he lost at least half the country right now doesn't think he actually lost an election, but- Oh, well, well, hang on, yeah, you're making assumptions yeah, my, there, uh, Yeah, some people don't think that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that people were kind yeah, of wondering, yeah, like, is every politician going to be crazy? Where's the Republican Party going to go? You know, what's going to happen? You saw kind of a few of these Trump replacement types come up. I feel like Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, I think, was kind of the most obvious, where oh, these people yeah. that try to beat Trump. And then you saw kind of more of the establishment Republicans try to come back. You know, everybody was feeling real good about DeSantis until he opened his mouth. Nikki Haley is kind of there on the side trying to do something. And I feel Rhino. like... What? Rhino. Oh, yeah. I feel like what happened was, yeah, Rhino is, Rhino is everybody who's not everybody who's not allegiant to Trump becomes a Rhino. Yeah. I feel like what actually happened was, I, I think that what was shown was Trump is a unique person in this moment in time. And I think when Trump goes, I think MAGA goes with him. I don't think that there is a figure, unless maybe his son, you know, is in training every day he steps into some kind of like training time chamber and he practices being his dad. Um, unless somebody he gets, can actually... He gets, um... He gets tangoed, right? He has to go through the the, the process of being orange up. Yeah, basically, yeah. Uh, Puts on the wig or something has to happen. Yeah, um, you know, learns to p p lean forward with his body in the wholly unnatural way that Trump does when he stands at podiums. But without a person to replace Trump, I think that the MAGA movement will just kind of dissolve and then maybe go back to wherever the Tea Party was or something before, a little bit more in line with things. And then we kind of see what, I guess, emerges from that chaos from there. But I don't think that the MAGA people can be led by anybody besides Donald Trump. Like, you see how quick they are to replace every single figure next to Trump. Uh, you know, like, it, it, that's literally, you talk about 1984. Um, you know, what was the observation that uh, the character made that they were speaking about being at war with one country and then the, in the middle of the speech, he changed to being at war with another country and people just went along with it and clapped and didn't even think about it. Uh, you know, the same thing happens with Trump. You know, today, uh, you know, Cohen is his personal lawyer and he's an awesome guy. And actually that guy's the worst person ever. And you know, McCarthy is the leader of the party and he's so cool, but actually he's a rhino or like everybody like comes and goes so quickly. It's a revolving door of loyalty. 
And I feel like once Trump is gone, I think people are going to be lost for a little bit. You know, there'll probably be another attempted insurrection or something. Who knows? And then after that, I think it'll kind of settle into something different. And all of the alternative and mainstream creators that supported uh, Donald Trump will pretend like they never liked him. They'll pretend like, oh, yeah, he was always kind of crazy, a little extreme. Uh, you know, I don't really support that dude. I don't really think I supported him. And then people will just carry on. That's my thought right now. But that's like a 10 percent conviction thought, because honestly, who the fuck knows like what would happen at this point? Because everybody's been primed to just be so fucking insane that, uh, I, I don't know, like half the Republican Party could Jonestown themselves and, and, and you know, think they're going to be abducted by aliens or something if Trump loses the election. I, honestly, who the fuck knows, yeah? No, but I, I think it's, it's the, the, you know, I remember when I was first doing my political studies and we had the, the debate in 2012 between Mitt Romney and Obama and... There's a comedian in the UK called Russell Howard, and he talks a lot about, you know, events at the time. Uh, and one of the ones that he made was sort of talking about how smooth and I just remember him doing this motion, which is like, mm, because he he thinks that Obama completely like, you know, doused uh, Mitt Romney with these quips and, and, and um, good uh, comebacks. Oh my God, I long for the days of decent, at least, uh, dialogue between people of opposing sides. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that Trump's, uh, well, as I said, it culminates in the sort of the pet eating thing or the fact that he's literally trying to, I don't know, um, emphasize that Harris, is she black or is she Indian? And it's like. And the dead babies being executed on the tables, and it's like, Jesus, yeah. Oh, oh Christ! Yes, I forgot about that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I just. It's, how far can we? Every time I think that we've reached the point of extremity, on like, okay, we have to get some kind of reversal here. It, it keeps going. Um, I, I do think a lot of it is about cult of personality with him, um, but I also do worry now that because the party has completely or so much reframed itself to be just around his entity. I, you know, survivability is 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 in question. I don't know. I, I just I really don't know what happens after that. And you know, personally, I do think I'm curious for your thoughts on this though as well, because like in the US, the UK, we have the FPTP, first past the post. So it's two predominant political parties. Um, and now you can talk about that being better for overall political stability because there's less coalition type governments and factions to take consideration of. But it leaves people with lack of choice. Um, do you think that there should be a general sh change in the political system of the US? You know, you might not like Jill Stein, but, you know, we should get the libertarians in there. We should get the Green parties just as an alternative, right, to try and diversify people's options. Um, I, I don't actually know constitutionally or structurally if our um, if our Congress can even have more than two parties in it. Actually, I'm not actually sure what the answer to that is. I'd have to, I guess, dig more into the composition of the uh, of how our Congress is actually set up structurally. Um, I do know that I, I've seen so much talk on different types of voting, like whether or not you do first past the post or rank choice or whatever. And it seems like truly all of them kind of have their own problems. Uh, so I, I'm not like, I'm not super attached to first past the post, but I'm not thinking that if we get rid of it, it'll fix our problems significantly. I don't know if that's the case in terms of having multiple parties. I've heard good arguments for having four parties. Uh, but I know also like parliamentary systems run into their own problems as well, where in the United States, we might get mad about a lack of choice. But then in countries that do coalition governments, they get upset because, uh, you know, a, a six seat party ends up dictating sometimes a lot of the agenda of the country, because the whatever coalition is formed by the majority government needs that six seated party to actually rule and do anything. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, the strongest argument that I heard posed for the four-party system is that it forces a little bit of moderation from the candidates, and it makes it so that one party can't go totally unhinged, because if they do, people can point towards another party. And there is a big issue right now. And I do have some sympathy, as hard as it is to have sympathy for anybody that's a conservative right now in the United States, I do have some sympathy for people who are like, you know... I really, I'm not the biggest Trump fan, but goddamn, I'm never voting Democrat. And truly, I just like, I like, I do enjoy guns. I don't trust these people not to come after him. But like, you're, you, you have to go all in on Trump. You have no other alternatives. And maybe having like a second left party and a second right party, even if those parties never gain a lot of support, maybe at the very least they do force some moderation from the candidates. Like, would the Republican Party tolerate Trump being so crazy if 
there was another conservative party that could soak up votes? Maybe not. Maybe that would. Maybe it wouldn't make Trump lose, but maybe it would force him to moderate a little bit because he knows that he can't be as crazy. You know, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm warm to those kinds of ideas, but I also think that something that's very important that people need to keep in mind is sometimes people are very quick to blame the structure or the system when in actuality that system is representing a true underlying problem, which is the electorate. And in the United States, we complain about the ineffectiveness of Congress or how divided we are politically right now. Well, that represents a true division in the people. And there is no system that's going to solve the true division right now that exists in the American population. We are half 50-50 divided and at each other's throats. And I don't think that you can you know whisk that away with just a different form of government i don't know how much that would help there yeah well yeah but like surely isn't 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 a degree of the information coming from trump himself yes it is he yeah is yeah so if you get rid of him surely that will be a, a slight improvement right obviously you're not going to improve the political and solar po solar po polarization that exists overnight but if you get rid of this monkey orangutan um, and, and actually get some reasonable individuals back in. I'm not saying it suddenly has to be um, Mitt Romney or something, but, you know, even just a Mike Pence, right? Mike Pence is pretty traditional. He's pretty far right. But yeah. even he respects the Constitution and respects just, I, I don't know, political civility. Yeah, but then, so um, then here's the issue then when you have, yeah, when you've got two parties is let's say that you don't, let's say you don't like Trump, but you're a conservative. What do you do? You either, you either grift and you pretend that you like Trump or you stand on principle and you stand against him and now you're out of job and you're never getting elected again. Now you chain eat or, you know, Kinzinger yourself and now, you, now nobody wants to deal with you because you're a rhino, like you said, right? Like now you're not part of the party anymore. And yeah, maybe maybe a four party system would solve that, you know, because at least you've got somewhere else to go and there's another conservative option for people to choose. But yeah, I'm not sure. I don't even know if we could, I don't even know if structurally the United States is allowed to do that without like significantly altering our constitution. No, I don't think you can do it. I don't think you can do that, but there is um. The electoral commission or something um there's a body in the us that has like a fuck ton of money and basically if the if a party surpasses i think it's two and a half percent of national overall votes mm -hmm. they gain access to this treasure trove of future um funds for um for subsequent election campaigns mm -hmm. so the point is that both parties are trying to suppress as much as well that's why rfk at one point what you know six months ago whenever he was at 22 percent of voter uh support looked like he could actually do it but then the liberal libertarians didn't endorse him and he was well he's rfk junior um but there is this point that you have this system this option that not many americans know about but like you literally just need to get one party supported yeah but the problem is that's like the worst thing in the world you never want that to happen because what happens is is, is because we do first past the post it's the spoiler effect right so like let's say that we do get uh, uh, some party that's achieved that amount of support and now they get some support uh in terms of access to those funds well, if you align with them ideologically and you start to vote for them, that means that you're not voting for another party that you would align with um, over the, the third one, right? So let, so we can use the Green Party as an example. Let's say the Green Party gets big enough and now you start voting for them. They're like, oh, cool, I feel good about this. Well, now you're never winning another presidential election ever. You can't do it because let's say 60% of the country supports either the Dems or the Green Party and now the other 40% supports the Republicans. They'll always have a plurality of the vote because because now you're dividing your votes between two similar-minded parties. And that's spoiler effect i think destroys the ability that's what i'm saying you'd have to have four parties you'd have to structuralize it somehow or instant like you'd have to be part of the institution because if these things emerge organically they always spoil the other party that you would otherwise ag agree with and want to vote for you know well yeah for sure but like no but what i'm saying is that this um mechanism right? i'm just going to call it that i can't remember exactly what it's called this mechanism is not saying that it's like you, you still have to address the overarching issue of of fptp mm -hmm. um but it's a good preliminary step towards really fundamentally revisiting um your political system and in the uk we had that opportunity in 2011 we had a what was known as the uh, alternative vote um and both parties labor left wing and uh, conservatives on right wing vote, campaigned super hard to ensure that the general public rejected it which they did why because the two main parties which are supposedly ideologically maybe not 100 percent you know opposite but you know enough uh, unaligned 
but they it was within their interest to do that because otherwise they power would be diluted because we have in the system and this is some of your one of your uh, one of the messages in the comments said asked about you know we do have an fptp system but it's less extreme the uk is like a us but diluted right our conservatives are like your democrats right and your republicans are like our i don't know you reform or uk it was right everything's a little bit more to the right in the us but out of european nations the uk tends to be the most capitalistic and sort of conservatively um aligned um so anyway so no i don't disagree with you i'm just saying that like it you know as a precursionary step but there was one other point which i think is worth considering which is that um who said it it was fitarian um he's from australia i think or, or um, um like australia has an interesting concept which is if you don't want to vote you have the option just to say i don't vote for any of the above mm -hmm. right why don't we have that system in the us or the uk right would do you think that would make a difference or not really well what is the i mean right now win. you could just not vote in the us right in australia you have that option because yeah, you because you have to vote right? but, it's, it's a physical announce, but if you don't go to the polls mm -hmm. the point is it keeps democracy ingrained in the minds of people yeah I actually i do polls. like that idea people used to say you know, should you be forced to vote in the U.S. like you, you know, like they do in Australia or some other countries? And I would say, well, no, I think the right to not vote is just as important as the right to vote. But the idea that you could just have an option saying, I, you know, I'm doing I, I call it a contest or um, oh, shit. yeah, like a whatever vote. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I fuck this election. I'm voting for no one. I think I think, yeah, actually, I think a mandated election would be a good idea. You should you should have to go vote, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm also being I'm also being told that this is the most uh, subdued you've ever been and that you're not uh, you're, you know, um, uh, you're not disagreeing with me, and uh, and apparently I've achieved something by having a conversation with you, not a not a, a rant or something. So I, I don't know what to make of that, but that's what I'm being told. So yeah, uh, I'm trying to see if I can raise out of you with that, but apparently not. So um. <laughs> well, we yeah, I have to find something. <laughs> the issue is that like the people that I tend to disagree with, not to self-aggrandize, uh, but like usually the people I tend to disagree with are are very horrendously misinformed on everything. So those are the most explosive conversations, but they're usually a dumb waste of time. Um, oh, okay. So you like you like being a masochist, in other words. Well, let's um, <laughs> let's entertain the masochism then. Um, you you feel much more strongly about, or you know, the history of Israel Palestine. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to know, well, generally, what's your position on it? Has it changed as the war has progressed? Did you have a very clear standing before October seventh? Uh, I didn't really know much at all before October 7th. Uh, I was one of those guys. Um, but for the first time in my life, uh, I got a ADHD diagnosis and I have a one fucking amphetamines now. So I can actually just sit and read things and focus without having to play video. I used to be a professional gamer. That's what I would always do. I'd play games, talk to people uh, that's and do stuff. Miss the US the, um, is the drug application. I need some amphetamines. <laughs> yeah. But the uh, so this has been the first like conflict that I've truly like historically dove into. Um, so yeah, so a lot of my basically most of my opinion, I had like standard boilerplate opinions prior to October 7th, but I wouldn't consider them very well informed. Um, now I think my opinion, I mean, obviously, it's a it's a very broad thing. But I, I would say that on the on the most macro level possible, I think that one of the huge issues with Israel and Palestine is Palestinians and Israelis both have really big incentives to never come to an agreement on anything. Um, Israel is able to continually expand territory in the West Bank under the guise of, you know, security. And Palestinians are able to fight forever because the international community seems to at least support them, you know, in word and through treaties and through condemnations from the ICJ and the ICC. So both sides are kind of have their own incentives to fight literally forever and never to come any kind of agreement. I think that the international community needs to dramatically change the way that they support both sides or just stop supporting any side so that both sides need to come to the table and actually figure out a solution. Uh, I think it is possible to do it. They just have no reason to right now. Like you would be an idiot if you were a Palestinian leader um, to accept anything because you know that the same deal or better is going to be on the table in five years and more of the international community is going to be on your side. And you'd be an idiot if you were an Israeli to accept a deal because, you know, why would you want Hamas or Hezbollah or, you know, somebody else growing, you know, wider and wider in territory next to you when you could just continue to annex more and more parts of the West Bank um, and use the Palestinians leverage to get deals with other countries like you do with the Abraham Accords. So yeah, I think that the international pressure has been really toxic for that region, in, in my opinion. Oh, damn. I was, uh, I was expecting sort of, you know, some things that I could disagree with and then off we go. But uh, that's very reasonable. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think that the situation is, um, well, in some ways I consider it irresolvable, to be honest with you. The, there is no middle ground at least for the short to medium term you've got some people on the israeli side who think that you know 
Palestinians should just get out of Israel 100% or out of, you know, Palestinian land and just assimilate into Jordan, Egypt and, and surrounding states. And then on the Palestinian side, you've got Hamas supporters more realistically. They just think, well, Israel will be eradicated. It will be removed as a state. And it's like, well, it's not that realistic either. Israel in its modern entity is well embedded there now. Um, and the sort of the erasure of either and sort of a singular a singular country occupying that bit of land is is just not realistic um i think one element which i'd be curious for your reflection on is the um i hate the netanyahu government i i, I and people think because i say i hate netanyahu i'm therefore anti you know anti-semitic obviously um the two things are exactly the same um how do you feel about that sort of the nuances there right because for me i think like you know, i used to go. think yeah so i guess before I did a lot of kind of the international studying. And then when I went there for two weeks, I did more of the kind of like the domestic paying attention. I used to have this understanding that Netanyahu was kind of this very far right lunatic leader. And then um, now my impression is, and this is informing my earlier takes on, on like coalition governments. It seems like what Netanyahu does well is he's just good at forming his coalition government. And my God, in Israel, there are a lot of small parties. You got to work with a lot of people to form a government. And it just seems like Netanyahu is good at doing that. And you have your Ben Givers, you've got your Smoltriches that you are trying to appease on your very far right radical side. So that's why this government has this characteristic of being pretty far right right now. Um, obviously, I don't like Netanyahu. I don't think it's good for the country that he's been in charge for so long. Um, I think that it shows an incredible amount of hubris and arrogance and stupidity that, um, you know, under his leadership, the assumption was just that they could kind of ignore Palestinians for uh, over a decade or decades, you know, um, since the end of, uh, of Oslo too, basically, I, that you could just like not worry about anything. And I, I think that's just been so dumb. But again, I, I mean, as I said earlier, I also kind of get it. Like, why would you come to an agreement with any of the Palestinians when you could also just slowly continue to annex and creep up on more and more and more of the West Bank? But yeah, I would say that in the long term, I, I really don't like Netanyahu and I don't like the things that his government's done. I think it's been really short sighted and really stupid. Well, but to be devil's advocate, do you not think he's just doing what is needed to be done to protect Israel and its right to exist? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think so. Like you said, I think that like there are other countries in the region have have recognized Israel's right to exist. You've got formal peace with, um, you know, with, with Egypt and Jordan, and now after the Abraham Accords with a few more Arab countries, like Israel's there to stay. They're not going anywhere. But like the only thing that could fuck up Israel's placement in the Middle East going forward, at least in my opinion, the only thing, the biggest threat they have is their reluctance to confront the the issue with the Palestinians because the the longer that continues to drive a wedge in Israeli society, it's also giving uh, reason for surrounding Arab states to maybe change their mind about their position with, with Israel, right? Like, don't, like, there's no confusion. Arab leaders have made deals with peace for Israel, but the Arab citizenry, on average, is not a big fan of, you know, the Jewish people or the Israeli citizens. And if the situation were to get bad enough with the Palestinians, I don't think it's inconceivable that the Arab world doesn't, you know, view Israel as favorably as they do right now, which also, I don't even know how favorably they view them now, just be, like, I don't know how much that is driven just by the fact that there's kind of, you've got the Iranian-Saudi conflict, right? That Israel is just kind of a convenient ally for that, for that southern axis versus, you know, your, your Iranian, Iraqi, um, uh, Saudi, not Saudi Arabia, uh, Syrian axis, right? That you've got these people. So Israel's kind of a convenient ally now. Um, I, I just, I think it's very worrisome that Israel could do something with its Palestinian population where some atrocity happens or some, you know, huge issue explodes again. And now some of the surrounding Arabs, the, the, it becomes intolerable for the Arab leadership to continue to remain uh, steadfast in their peace agreements with Israel. It's just so stupid. Like they have to figure that out. It's such a stupid, it's so stupid and arrogant that they haven't put like huge efforts into, into actually solving that issue. Yeah. Yeah, I think what I would say, I mean, we've had a lot of conversations about it on, on, on my channel with sort of people who, I don't know, I try to engage both sides and and be comprehensive in that. Um, one of the things that people on both sides have sort of acknowledged, albeit for different reasons or, or support or not, alignment, is that, you know, surrounding nation states, Arab states, have not been very keen to, maybe because it sets a dangerous precedent, but they've not been keen to sort of uh, take Palestinian refugees and asylum seekers, right? Well, the, that's so, because of the, I think it's Arab Resolution 
is it 1547 or 1537? The, one of the Arab resolutions literally forbids anybody that's part of the Arab League from actually accepting them as a refugee because it's supposed to keep the the hope for the Palestinian lands alive. <laughs> So they literally can't, they're not allowed to actually make them citizens if they take them as refugees. They have to live on those borders in the camps, which is, yeah, which is really bad. That's why you have like five or six million Palestinian refugees today. The number just, you know, gets bigger every year. Yeah. No, and, and the, um, the, I mean, that people are just like, oh, they should just go and live in Jordan since it was Arab Jordan and, and, and sort of therefore they'll be at home there. But it's like, do you know the population density of Jordan as it stands? Um, and the difference in sort of educational level and uh, and generally things have changed since the 1940s and 30s and so on between Jordanians and, and the Palestinians within uh, the West Bank and, and Gaza. It's changed a lot. And but what I do think also is also interesting and I'm curious is, you know, the pragmatism of, well, let's be honest, Saudi Arabia, right? MBS has not made it very um, vague or opaque that whilst he, you know, supports the... Um, you know, his his brothers and sisters in their right to self-determination at the same time, clearly real politique and pragmatism is taking precedence and that, you know, the interception or allowing of their airspace to be used by the Israelis, the US, British, whoever, for the various, um, you know, activities, shall we call them, with the Houthis um, earlier in the summer or with uh, the Iranians' mass attack in April 13th. You know, what's your assessment there? Is this just a complete sellout by the Saudi uh, king um, or, 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 you know, they're just being doing what every country would do? In terms of their like allegiance to or alliance with Israel and kind I of... I United- talk a lot about supporting Palestine and its right to existence and self-determination, but in reality, they're doing a lot more to just, well, support Israel's self-defense. Yeah, I mean, it's, I it's, you're, 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 they're like, they're playing the game, right? That's why I said there's a difference between, you know, like word on the Arab street versus... Uh, the the actual Arab leaders themselves. I think that the leaders are, they want to see their countries grow. They want to enter, you know, the the new century with trade and they want to grow their economies and they want to make things available to their citizens. And that Palestinian problem is like kind of always there. So they have to pay it some kind of lip service. But like, do they actually care? I mean, the leadership, I don't think they do. Um, the citizenry will get upset every now and then, but uh, the citizenry probably doesn't care that much either. Um, I think that when you had like this Soviet US divide, I think that that probably drove it uh, a lot more. You know, it's no coincidence that, you know, the Madrid Peace Conference happened in 91 and that led to peace with Jordan and that you saw tensions in the area kind of, you know, decrease after the collapse of the Soviet Union and everything. I think that. Um, I think the leadership is ready to move on. The citizens will probably follow eventually, but you still have to kind of pay lip service and do the condemnation and we can't believe what's happening, right? It's one thing to to say something and condemn it, but I mean, if you look at their actions, right? When Iran went to attack uh, Israel, uh, you know, over the course of this Gaza war, you saw Jordan, you saw Saudi Arabia, you know, intercept rockets on on behalf of Israel. That was a really big deal uh, in terms of sending a message to Israeli leadership about where all the countries in the region stand, so. So what's... What's the what's the what's the pathway forward in your opinion? Um, it has to be like a strong leader. Like the United States needs to go and tell Israel, like, hey, listen, uh, you guys really need to figure this out. Uh, and if you don't, we're nuking you or we're just abandoning you. Good luck. Like, this is stupid uh, because it hurts <laughs> us. It hurts our leadership. It's it's a liability to us, which it shouldn't be. Um, and it's a liability to Israel. Now, if they're too short-sighted and stupid to see it, then, I mean, then fuck them. Then the United States has to make them see it, right? Jimmy Carter did it, um, you know, when he was working to, uh, you know, help Menachem Begin with uh, Egypt. Uh, like, the U.S. has been involved in helping Israel move towards peace before, and it's taken huge commitments from leaders to do it in the past it was carter bill clinton tried uh and failed and now we need what whoever the next leader is in the united states has to say hey listen you need to you have to figure this shit out because this is fucking stupid and it can't be like the oh we're yeah, gonna but- sanction one or two people in the west bank it has to be like you got to figure this out and the rest of the world needs to fuck off in supporting the palestinians um the idea behind like hamas is just like resistance fighters or freedom fighters this is fucking stupid uh if you're protesting in some college campus waving around a houthi flag or hamas flag you're a fucking brain dead dipshit you're a kid nobody should take you seriously for any reason anyway and yeah these two people need to feel like they have a real incentive to figure it out, I think. And right now that's missing. There hasn't been like strong international leadership that's been brave enough to step in and say, this is how we're going to fucking do this. Figure it the fuck out, you know? Sure. I mean, you know, uh, in those words, um, well, I guess this is where the British side of me is like, but to be fair, actually, you talk about the um, the need for them just to to make a decision. Kamala, she's a lot more, I did a, I did a bit of digging on her foreign policy. Uh, and she's going to be, I think, of anywhere a, a big, deta- immediate, not- noticeable departure from Biden is on this file. 
she's a lot more sympathetic to the Palestinian perspective, and while she's still more, you know, what moderate Democrats still going to support Israel, I think she's going to be a lot tougher on the Bibi Netanyahu government to actually make a fucking difference or get rid of him um you know i mean i think netanyahu is supposed to be out next formal elections anyway right I, aren't most people saying he's probably going to be out but when's he going to when's he going to call those elections exactly well i think aren't there, aren't there a set like you can call elections but aren't there set ones coming up that he has to i, I would have to go and check again but i thought um but uh, hopefully he's gone. <laughs> I, well, I, I would have gone as soon as possible. Trust me. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I, I agree. But like you also mentioned something else, which is um, which is um, escaping me about the sort of the long term sort of pr- perspective of this. I think that the yeah people on both sides have to get I think a little bit more realistic. But at the same time, do you not think that? None of this is feasible, partially because we need a different Netanyahu gov- uh, different government, but also because there's no clear power structure leadership that isn't Hamas, right? The reason Hamas was supported is because the many Palestinians, not all, but a large proportion of Palestinians felt that they were the ones who would only actually actively stand up for their rights and interests um, vis-a-vis, you know, the, the um, settlement encroachment and so on. But, you know, Fatah, the... the uh, Palestinian Authority, these more political bodies, quote unquote, have failed. So what, what you know, we need to what recreate them, resuscitate them, create something entirely new. We can't accept, or at least Israelis cannot accept that Hamas still is in the picture, right? Or you? I mean, you, you should Hamas should Hamas be in the picture in any way, size, shape, or form? Personally, I don't think so. But is that for Israel to dictate? I'm also not sure. There are a million reasons right now why it seems impossible that Israel could figure out any peaceful long-term arrangement with um, the Palestinians. But I mean, the history of Israel, I feel like the reason why that country was able to accomplish so much was because there was this ever-present idea of, of utter annihilation that was right beyond any kind of failure. Right. That, you know, after the formation of the country, you know, the independence was in you know, 47, 48. And then that was after the Holocaust. And this is the only Jewish country in the world. And your history is completely fucked. And now you're surrounded by fucking enemies. I feel like that forced this insane pragmatism onto the country that made it navigate decisions in, in very pragmatic, very realistic, very harsh, very quick, very decisive ways. And if you're like the idea that Israel was was able to survive multiple wars really on its own until 73, right? That they were able to survive multiple wars against all these surrounding Arab states without without any of their help from other countries on the planet and were able to figure out like peaceful, like like peace with, e- with Egypt in 79, right? And then with Jordan, the fact that they were able to do all these things and now we're saying today in 2024 and current year that Israel can't figure out peace with Palestinians, I don't believe it. I think it's laziness. I don't think there's ever been a real effort or a desire to do it. I think that things like the Abraham Accords are a testament to the hubris and the arrogance that Israel's like, oh, Oh, we can just continue to sign peace with every other country and fuck the Palestinians and things like 20 uh, was it 2018 the the movement of the embassy to Jerusalem and like ha, this is our capital we did annex East Jerusalem fuck you guys um, that's not smart this isn't Israel playing an intelligent game this isn't them doing what they have to do this is just a, an arrogant country that feels like it's untouchable and that it can just ignore the Palestinians forever and I think October 7th reminded them you can't you're gonna have to do something about this and yeah I, I think that if they were forced to to, to actually consider like, hey, this has to be solved, then I don't know if that looks like more negotiations with the Palestinian Authority, you know, empowering them more, more direct talks with Mahmoud Abbas, um, you know, more, some type of bilateral relationship, like something has to happen. And I don't feel like they've been, they don't feel like they have to figure something out. And that lack of necessity, I, I think is undermining a, a lot of what's happened so far. They're, oh, we can't figure that out. We can't do anything. It's like, I, I don't believe that, but. Yeah, but don't. But the thing I've noticed is in, in both my times engaging both sides to my own detriment, I guess, masochism, is that um, the Israelis tend to be a little bit more organized, um, particularly the ones who are hardline, you know, the Palestinians, it's just all no, no chance. They tend to be a little bit more. You, you sort of referenced it yourself in the, the sort of a lot of the supporters of the Palestinians or even Hamas. They tend to be younger. They just they're just on the social movement because it's considered to be more the progressive left. It's more the sort of the hip thing to do. Younger people, but they don't understand that there's nuance here to use that word right. Um, and they sort of they just jump on the bandwagon because it's like oh yeah you know the Palestine we're going to support Palestine. It's like well hang on guys like. 
100 percent october 7th didn't just happen out of nowhere but equally you are like when you're saying yes go hamas like well whoa, whoa, whoa. you do know what hamas represents right it's not the same as palestine mm-hmm. so do you not think that there needs to be a, a a better organization within the palestinian side not just mahmoud abbas they they've got no lineation of of uh, of well, subsequent leaders. Well, There's I mean, think really about it. Like, power. Palestinians truly, people get mad when I say this, but Palestinians haven't suffered a political loss um, since 1947, right? The, the every single time there is talk about settling, you know, a peaceful solution w- with Israel, it's always back to the 67 borders. It's always back to basically the original partition plan, every single time. No matter how many wars are started and lost, no matter, no matter how many terrorist attacks happen, no matter who takes up, you know, whatever types of governments, Hamas, whatever, it's always back to the 67 borders. It's always where the conversation goes back to. So if you're Palestinian and you feel like you always have that as an option that you can retreat to, I mean, then why sign any deal that's less than, you know, the world, that's less than giving you everything you want? And yeah, I just think third party intervention in this has made it really toxic, right? Like, why would you negotiate with somebody when the ICC is saying that, you know, that you have Galan and, and, and Netanyahu are war criminals and, and when the ICJ is saying that you're being genocided and, you know, when when people in Israel, when Haaretz is saying, or, or uh, Betzalem is saying that it's an apartheid, like, well, I'm not going to negotiate peace with these guys. I'm just going to wait for the rest of the world to bail me out. Um, that's a huge problem. It has to stop. The third party intervention for, from dipshits has to stop because it's, yeah, it's just, it's driving everybody's expectations on both sides to, to impossibly unrealistic heights. And yeah, at some point, both sides need to feel like they have to come and, and, and make an agreement. You know, maybe on the Palestinian side, maybe that means more Arab leadership. That's kind of been suggested for a while. I think there was a rumor that that was floated that Saudi Arabia would step in and, and take a more active role. I don't even know if they would want or allow for that. Um, the Palestinians and then on the Israeli side, there needs to be more pressure. Yeah, figure out your West Bank stuff. Like, why, why are we still building more and more and more settlements into this land that, like, now, now, because now Israel's truly fucked itself, right? There was a reason why in 48 they didn't press, you know, so much more into the West Bank and stuff. It wasn't just because they didn't have the ability to do it. It's because um, they, they knew at the time that they, the demographic issue would be insurmountable. You can't absorb that many Arab citizens. And now, well, what have they done? Now you've built all along into the fucking West Bank. What are you going to do? You can't do a one-state solution, but are you really going to pull all those settlements out? You can't do that. So it just, it has has to be solved. It ha- there has to be pressure to solve it. It can't keep going on in, 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 the, in the direction that it's going. There has to be some pressure to solve it. Yeah. Yeah, but where is it resolved, right? A couple of points, and uh, you know, you, I welcome your, your perspective if you see mm-hmm. it differently. But like, also, the, just as a heads up, so it doesn't sound like I'm dodging or evading, I have another guy I have to talk to, so I've got eight minutes left for this talk, so go for it. Eight Amir. minutes? Eight minutes. All right. Yeah. Well, go let's, um, okay, well, we're going to talk about Sudan, <laughs> and then, no, I mean, I was just wondering, mm-hmm. actually, how long we were going to, I've got, like, four pizzas that are getting cold here. <laughs> I, I, I ordered one, and somehow four came. Anyway, okay. uh, if anyone wants any pizza and they're in London, let me know. But anyway, um, right, so there's a couple points here. Yeah. Um, Turkey is quite a unique actor in that it's, quite os it's quite isolated or it's it's ostracized amongst a lot of middle eastern states but erdogan was very quickly like we want to be the ones to uh be the peace brokers um you know we want to be there we'll offer a peacekeeping force to manage the gaza area quickly rejected uh erdogan hedges a lot but i don't know if you've got any thoughts on turkey and obviously what they've been doing with the israeli comments but still part of nato still supporting us and stuff right double standards there but second also um there has been this idea of an arab league uh, sort of peacekeeping force but it seems very unlikely because just no country seems very willing to do that and it kind of comes back to what we talked about with ukraine and russia at the beginning which is even if you get some kind of ceasefire be it temporary sustainable or whatever that doesn't necessitate a uh, long-term peace plan and political rebuilding and 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 you know um coexistence so i don't know any thoughts i mean turkey i don't know if anybody wants turkey to be involved turkey has not been a, a fan of israel um there's been a lot of kind of weird shit i know that whole flotilla incident originated with like um turkish people being on that i think in 2008 was it for the flotilla or maybe it was 2006 um I, I don't think israel i don't think the jews are a fan of the turks i don't think arabs are a fan of the turks um i like turkey i know they love to bomb the fuck out of the kurds i, I don't know if they get along with any of the threading um you know like arab people at all i i don't know if anybody wants the turks involved necessarily i'm, I'm not sure but you also have like this um i think there's several reasons why i can give some more uh you can load these very heavily in some direction you know um a very 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 pro-zionist person might say that the palestinians would never agree to an arab peacekeeping force there because after one month of an arab peacekeeping force 
being there, nobody around the world would ever again complain about the Israeli treatment of the Palestinians because Palestinians have no idea what brutal oppression or treatment looks like until you have an Arab state that's occupying you, right? That there are reasons why, you know, 300 to 500,000 Syrians are dead to the north, why hundreds of thousands have died in the, in the Yemen, you know, uh, civil war over the past decades. I mean, truly over the past century. Um, there's a reason why an Arab peacekeeping force here would look so much worse uh, than whatever Israel's been doing. And that might undermine a lot of the narrative of, well, look, Israel's screwing us over. Um, it might also be seen as being like a, a, a backstabbing or a, a being, you know, more of a traitor to the Arab population that now you're, you know, the, the Palestinians already don't like the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian National Authority. They already feel like that's a security subcontractor for Israel. And now other Arab states are going to be security subcontractors for Israel. Like, is that really what's going to happen? You're going to oppress us so that Israel can continue to inhabit these lands. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's what needs to happen is there have to be brave leaders. There's no substitute for that. There have to be individuals. There needs to be probably a U.S. president that comes out and says, we're going to figure this shit out. There probably need there needs to be uh, an Israeli leader that's willing to probably, unfortunately, make a big political sacrifice. It's happened in the past, um, you know, with, with Rabin, with Begin. Um, and there probably needs to be at least one Arab leader. I don't know if that's MBS or, or somebody else that's also willing to come to the table and say, hey, or the Jordanian, you know, monarch, somebody, there have to be people that come together and say, we really, truly do want to figure this out. Um, I don't know if, if Mahmoud Abbas is the guy to do it with or if it's going to be his successor, but yeah, it's, there's going to be some people that have to come to the table to try to figure this out because it's probably not going to be Turkey. I don't know if anybody likes Turkey down there. I, an Arab League peacekeeping force is just punting the problem down the road. It's not getting you any closer to an actual solution. You, you need people that actually want to take the political hits to solve the problem, I think. That's, that's my feeling, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, no, look, I mean, I, I, I dumped a bunch of stuff on you there in the last, what, four or five minutes to see how you did, and you and you splurted out is in, in all the skill that you have there. Um, no, Turkey's not anywhere. I, I don't know if, I, I think people don't like the Turks. It's more they don't like Erdogan. And, and Turkey Turkey tried to, or Erdogan tried to introduce this idea of neo-Ottomanism as a way sort of to sort of bring the Middle East together. Turkey's obviously the most powerful military, relative speaking, but it's not the biggest uh, in terms of like uh, cultural law. You know, you've got other big players like Egypt or Saudi Arabia really come to mind. Obviously, Iran is a whole different entity. Um, but yeah, no, they're not going to be in there. You know, you could see a UN peacekeeping force coming through here if you do see the great powers finally agreeing on something but the russians and the chinese like to use it as a uh, as a well political messaging vehicle uh, about the hypocrisy of the united states over international security and commitments and norms and stuff like that mm -hmm. but the interesting thing is if you look at their own interests right realistically speaking neither chinese nor russia really wants um, uh, Palestine to become self-determinant because what impact does that have on their relationship with their own relative countries? I'm thinking Taiwan, right? What precedent does it set that might be a bit awkward for Beijing and Moscow to recognize? But anyway, uh, I'd love to, you know, pick this up with you another time. It's been fun. Thank you very much for having me on for all this time. And, uh, well, I don't know, humoring probably perhaps my very mild questions next to some other ones you're used to. No, you're good. If but, a particular, uh, yeah. like, topic or thing ever comes up or if somebody emails you and, you know, they're like, Destiny said this and he's such an idiot on this and you, you guys super disagree on this, yeah, we can always hop on and chat or shoot the shit or whatever. Just let me know. Yeah. Oh, let's, yeah, let's shoot the shit uh, whenever. Um, it was fun. As I say, I had two beers and lots of pizza waiting. But uh, cheers, guys, um, for watching on Destiny. So I look forward to seeing you all in the future. Yeah, and people can find you on YouTube is the platform you like to plug the most, right? Yeah, so you can find me there. if you're interested in what I said, um, hopefully it won't be too long-winded, then my name, Piotr Curzin Geopolitics, will come up. Um, and yeah, I'll be sure to have you back on, or we can do it again sometime, hopefully, in the future. Cool. Um, but yeah, look all forward right. to it. Yeah, thanks cheers a lot. Up. Have a good one. Bye.